Bitcoin is on a roll as we enter day number three of virtual blockchain week. And we've got an incredible roster of speakers to bring you their latest thoughts on the markets, the world, and what happens next. Roger Ver and CZ will be our opening and our closing keynotes. And in between, there is so much value, you're not going to want to miss a single beat. So welcome to day three of the world's most amazing virtual blockchain event, Virtual Blockchain Week. And that guy right there, that would be my co-host, Mr. Travis Wright. Yes, yes. Hello, hello, everybody. How are you doing? So Day three. So you said on the toi? You said toi? On the toi. We are ein, zwei, drei. Or uno, dos, three. tres. Yeah. Adin, dva, tri. Because we all Russian bots here. This is welcome <laughs> to Russian bot podcast. We will talk to, about, about the Bitcoin today and uh, how to please uh, uh, Putin. It's it's a happy day actually for Bitcoin, and uh, we're gonna we'll go to Coin Gecko in just a moment. And actually, we've got the founder of Coin Gecko that's going to be joining us here in a couple minutes. But Bitcoin is on a run, Mr. Travis Wright, and uh, there you could feel it in the air. There's just there's some there's a the having vibe is happening. Wait, have you been outside? I have. Are been you outside. going against? Are you going against sanctions out again? Going outside? I, I breathing in air. I need my fresh air every day, my friend. Well, Mother Russia does not appreciate you going against sanction. Everybody, please share that this broadcast is live from wherever you're watching, whether on YouTube or Facebook, or Twitter, Periscope, uh, DLive TV, our friends at Theta.TV, wherever the stream is coming to you, please share and let others know that you are live actually i'm kicking off the theta stream right now boom there it is it's live now and uh we want to give a shout out to our sponsor mr travis Wright. would you like to tell our uh viewers about it while i bring up their screen that sounds like a great idea let me open up that i did not have that our show notes open yet i got all of our daily images open but not that here we go show You're unpreparified and I'm still glowing from the VIP networking thing. It was just so much, so much fun. We had Amazing. so many people in there and all these different breakout rooms. It was really good. Yeah. Title sponsor, Cryptomatic ATM. Big thanks to them. Uh, title sponsor, Cryptomatic ATM. Now you can start your own business earning passive income by placing your own crypto to cash and cash to crypto German built ATM for public use. Like you can just place this bad boy at rest. You can place that grocery stores, maybe medical dispensaries, all kinds of different cool places you could place these things. And as crypto is quickly becoming part of the everyday world life, it is creating a demand for an easy solution to exchange between those cryptos and cash. And that's what you can do. And you can actually win a Cryptomatic ATM, right, Mr. Joel Com? How's this yep. work? 
Absolutely. Well, we're uh, two of them are being given away this week. The first one will happen tonight after CZ's keynote. We'll be joined by Joff Paradise of Cryptomatic ATM to draw the first winner. In order to be eligible to win, you have to register for Virtual Blockchain Week. If you're watching the stream elsewhere, make sure you go to virtualblockchainweek.com. Click the register free button here. It'll go zoop, take you where you need to go. Click right here, enter to win, to register, and make sure you drop your Ethereum wallet address in there as well so that you can be eligible. Thanks to Cryptomatic for uh, making this conference possible. And we're going to be having a fireside chat with CZ, I believe. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> we're gonna maybe he'll feel the heat a little bit i don't know uh, but mr travis Wright, we have our first guest waiting here in the wings and i want to actually bring up this website before i bring him in because uh, they're a partner with us they're our favorite go-to site for checking out the crypto markets it's coingecko.com actually let me refresh the page bitcoin is currently eight thousand seven hundred and sixteen dollars and with that said, I want to bring in the co-founder of CoinGecko, Mr. Bobby Ong. Bobby, come on into the Zoom. We can't wait to 26% this week, Bitcoin, baby. Uh. Yeah. <clears throat> Welcome, Bobby. How are you? Hey, yeah. Hey, yeah. Good to hey, see hey. you, friend. Look at all the green here today. This has got to make, you know, CoinGecko fans happy. Yeah, it's been a terrific day. I mean, price has been going up. It's like a rocket ship. Yeah, what do you think it's all having? Do you think it's virtual blockchain week? Um, is it some other factor? Yeah, virtual halving. Uh, I mean, virtual blockchain week definitely plays the role, I suppose. Uh, definitely the halving, I suppose. Um, uh, it's less than 12 days ago. I'm really excited. Are you guys excited? as excited as I am? Very much so. Yeah, like, let's bring it. Yeah, that was one of the reasons why we wanted to do Virtual Blockchain Week really before uh, that that main, before the having because like here's this buildup that's happening and like it seems like it might be a really good time for the cryptos and uh, who knows. So this is an interesting time. Maybe tell us a little bit, what, what are some of the things that you're seeing? And Because for one, Bobby, thank you so much for being part of this. Thanks for coming on. I think your reports, your quarterly reports are amazing. The information that you put out is very, very valuable. You want to maybe talk about that or talk about some of the things that you got going on over there at CoinGecko? Yeah, uh, it's been a very exciting time for us. Uh, we are now the largest independent crypto data aggregator. Um, we, we have one of the most comprehensive database. We track over 7,000 tokens, uh, plugged into over 400 exchanges. Things have been uh, very good for us uh, in the past couple of months. Uh, it's very exciting as we run up towards the halving and uh, the team has been really hard at work trying to improve the user experience on CoinGecko and then uh, we've been uh, publishing quite a lot of things recently. So like one of the things was that we have this uh, annual report, which uh, quarterly report actually, which we've been publishing for the past, uh, past couple of years or so. This is the 11th such report and the, last one, the latest one that we published in, Q, in Q1 has been really interesting. Um, we also published a book recently, it's called uh, How to DeFi, which is basically a 200 page book on decentralized finance. Um, yeah, the team has been really hard at work. Uh, there's been more content, more interesting research coming up on the CoinGecko team. Yeah, it, it is my go to site uh, all the time. I stopped using CoinMarketCap um, probably about, you know, really after we interviewed you on the podcast and discovered all the tools you had and the reports you put out, I'm like, this is just, there's more information here. So I'm wondering, what are your thoughts on Binance acquiring coin market cap? And is there a conflict of interest for this company that has access to the most data to be managing this site? Yeah, um, definitely agree with the point of view. I think it's going to be hard for CoinMarketCap to stay independent. Um, I mean, they say they're going to be independent. Binance say it's going to stay transparent and neutral, but you know, it's really hard trying to do that. Uh, you just need a third-party provider to kind of keep mm-hmm. things equal between all the exchanges, with all the, all the coins. And, and 
And you know, Binance has has their own point of view of what should and should not be done. And sometimes we most of the time we agree with them, which is fine. But there are sometimes when we don't agree with the people don't agree with what Binance is doing, and, and that's not good for the community. And and it almost feels that Binance is growing so big and so large in so many areas that there's a huge centralization risk in the industry. And and we just need someone like a third party an independent provider. Uh, so yeah, I definitely agree with that point of view that it's going to be hard. And definitely, there's a conflict of interest, and we just need to have like um, a third, an independent side like CoinGecko to to for the betterment of the community. Is there anything? Because we're going to talk to him later tonight. Is there anything that, from an industry perspective, that you think would be crucial for us to ask CZ about uh, Coin Market Cap? Mm, nothing much. I Is mean, it to put him to the fire? <laughs> <laughs> what would you well, ask him, Bobby? Like maybe like why don't they disclose the amount that was purchased for? Why why keep it hush hush? Like I mean, it was announced there was four hundred million, but it was never publicly confirmed. Like I mean, if it's an amount, why don't you just confirm it? Confirm it. Right. Well, so here's here's my question for you then. You know, when you're seeing CMC get acquired for maybe four hundred million, you're the next biggest you know site for this type of data. You've got to be going. Oh snap. He's going. Um, <laughs> so, do you, you know, would you sell to an exchange? Because if there's questions about, you know, the integrity of the site, because, you know, a big exchange owns it, how would you feel about selling your site? Yeah. Um, so we, we, we don't, we don't have any plans to sell at this point in time. Um, I think the, the industry is just, it's just really at its infancy at this point in time. Um, I mean, we, we can definitely say that 7,000 tokens at this point in time compared to what it was when we started six years ago, back in 2014, when we only had like 20 tokens or so. It's definitely a, like a 50x improvement from what it was and the industry, we, cannot, we can argue that it's a mature industry. But from my point of view, I think this crypto industry is just really at its early stage. If you think about a future where anything and everything that can be tokenized will be tokenized, um, that we are nowhere near its potential. Imagine a, a future where Bobby has his own token, Joel has his own token, Travis has his own token, Bitcoin has his own token and growing every day further. And it's become really easy to set up its own token uh, with all this utility and things. Everyone will have his own token. We have, his own, we have their own token. We are nowhere near their potential. And I think the industry will be super early at this stage. And the real mainstream players haven't really come into the stage yet. So I think selling out at this stage is really early and we have no intention to do so because we, the aim is to just grow and, 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 and capture as much information as we can in the industry. And, and what we see is that um, if we look into the industry from what, when we started back in a few years ago, there was no DeFi back then. There was no exchange token. There, was, there wasn't a lot of things. And who knows what the future will hold. And we want to track all this information. And when the time is right, I don't know, a few years from now, the big players will come in and then we will probably uh, sell it to the, to the right guys then. You did mention, you know, bad coin being listed. We actually do have a currency and we'll tell you guys more about it um, at a, a little later date. But Bobby, we got to let you go. Thanks for coming in. We really appreciate, um, you know, the data that you put out there and you are our go-to reference. You're doing Thanks great work, me. brother. Appreciate what you're doing. Coingecko.com, a different kind of lizard, not not mm -hmm. the one that'll save you money and your auto yeah, insurance. You're not going to save 15% on your cryptos by going to CoinGecko. You are Doesn't not going to save on your auto insurance. Travis, while I prepare to bring our next guests in, would you like to go ahead and introduce who they are? And I'm going to get things aligned here. For sure. Now, back in February, I think Joel and I, we went to one of our last, actually, we went to our last event together and it was uh, nf it was ny nft nyc i guess nyc has their own domain name i that's pretty handy. is there a dot denver joel i don't think so is there a dot kansas city i don't know i, don't I think know. that's that's cityest they need to they need to make sure that we have other cities handled but what we're going to do here at this one we got some really great folks here we have uh one we have alex atala who is the co-founder of open c which is the largest marketplace for non-fungible tokens. Uh, we also have with us Jody Rich, who is, I believe, the CEO of People Browser and uh, NFT.cred, which is the platform for creating and sharing NFTs. And we also have Vandana Taksali. That's I right. I, got, I think I got that close. 
and she's an art agent and intellectual property and business lawyer for artists, creatives, and entrepreneurs at Int Council Law Firm. So we got we got ourselves a nice little panel here of amazing it's minds. A, it's a trio, and I know that um, you guys have a lot to say in a short period of time, so we're going to turn it over to you. Brilliant. Thank you so much. So we're going to talk about non-fungible tokens, and I think lots of people don't even know what a non-fungible token is. It's a way of registering your digital assets on the blockchain. And what that really means, we're going to hear from Vandana about art. We're going to hear from uh, megastar Alex about his incredible business OpenSea, where you can register and sell and do amazing things with your NFTs. And I'm going to tell you about one of our projects. Um, my short story is I was born in New York, went to school in Australia. That's why I talk like this. And uh, I run an event with Cameron Bale uh, called NFT NYC every year where we bring the NFT industry together. Um, we own a platform that creates social networks and we've recently done a deep integration with Ethereum so we can tokenize people's content. And uh, the content that we're most excited about tokenizing is actually virtual events. And what most of you probably don't realize is that every 12 seconds, there is a new public Zoom. And we are now tokenizing those Zooms. We're ranking them, we're scoring them, we're putting them into a discovery engine. And if you're the owner of the event, you're actually able to tokenize all the content send out smart invitations and uh, allow your attendees to give each other tokens so that you create audience engagement. And uh, my friend Joel is showing a landing page that we're previewing. Um, that's my quick story. And at the end, I'll talk a little bit about uh, something that uh, Tim Draper mentioned on Monday, which is how do you address uh, Bitcoin wallets um, with short addresses? So Alex, do you want to jump in and, um, Maybe tell us what's the coolest thing you've seen on OpenSea? What's the coolest NFTs you've seen on OpenSea? And maybe how does, how does COVID-19 affect what's going on with OpenSea? Thanks, Jody. First, just want to say thanks for inviting me to this panel. I definitely think there's so many areas in Zoom where I just kind of get fi like fidgety and I want to do something. And it's like a perfect platform for adding more content mm. and tokenizing content. Um, more generally, content is king, even in, in, especially when it comes to NFTs. So during COVID-19, we're seeing a lot more artistic content. And I think it, it, it could be just correlation, but we're seeing people want to become stay-at-home entrepreneurs or do more uh, things where they can just take art and take work that they've done for other projects that never went anywhere and develop it a little more and become known for their creativity. So well, we, we see this pattern where someone goes on, like creates an anonymous Twitter account for their art. And then they go to OpenSea and they create a storefront where they upload their art and tokenize each uh, digital piece as an NFT. It can be animated, uh, it can be a video, it can even be a 3D model and then users, our users, some of them have bots that just constantly scrape OpenSea for new content. And when they see new items go on sale, they look to see what the market looks like, um, how other people are viewing this artist, and then they, they, they buy these pieces. And sometimes with the intention of making money and, and selling them for a profit later, and sometimes just to build really interesting collections. So we've seen lots of people create uh, their account, curate account pages full of interesting art. That's just new from COVID. Um, we're seeing the same kinds of game activity that we, that we have normally where games are tokenizing components or characters or uh, land like parcels inside of the game and letting their own users own a stake of the game by owning these game pieces. And that's still the primary type of item that you see getting traded on OpenSea. Everything is and based what, on Ethereum right now. And what's cool about it is that all of these tokens are registered on the blockchain. So it's it's an open platform for people who don't really understand NFTs. This is an open platform. And 
and you really own your own data. You really own your own content. You own your own tools, don't you? Oh, what do you mean own your own tools? Well, you own, you own the things in the game. You own the things that you're using. Oh. You own, you own yeah. everything. Um, and it's a way of registering your content. That's, that's really the big thing. And I think, Vandana, that's what you're going to talk about, how artists can register. Um, and you were telling me, I think yesterday on the phone, about how, um, how you're happy to own a piece of art during COVID-19 that might even be just a fraction of that art, as long as you can enjoy it at home. It's all good. Do you want to jump in? Yeah, no, no, for sure. Exactly. I mean, I think what we're seeing, especially with what's happening with COVID-19 and a lot of galleries just not being opened and um, uh, potentially losing a lot of money. I mean, um, the, you know, some galleries sadly may not may not open at all. And so, you know, we're seeing with Art Basel, one of the biggest art fairs, they had to have virtual viewing rooms. So I think what's really exciting for me is seeing that artists that are used to traditionally showing art in the physical realm can now show it in the digital realm with NFTs and with blockchain. And I think that's very exciting because we're going to see new ways of doing creative projects that we haven't seen before. Um, you know, st stretches of the imagination where, where, where you can have collaborations between artists, um, you know, as an NFT and being able to monetize that and track who's owed what. Um, you know, you're going to see all these, um, you know, I interesting things. I mean, even now you're seeing galleries that are still going ahead with their openings and they're having it virtually. And, uh, you know, people are, are, are coming to that. And I think it speaks to the fact that at the end of the day, you know, is a physical piece all that different than a digital piece? I think what the differentiating factor is now is before we never had a way to have that unique identifier and to protect that digital piece. And so, you know, we valued the physical realm a little bit more, but I think that's now changing. And, and now with NFTs, we can, you know, go ahead and protect uh, digital art. And so I think we're going to be seeing a lot more of that. It's, it's going to be great for the artists, uh, mm. you know, to monetize and yeah. So it gives artists the ability to actually track royalties as well, because as, as yeah. an artist, as an artist, you can say, well, in my smart contract, I'd like to have a little piece of every every resale of my art. And then for galleries, it means that galleries can become virtual galleries. And so people yeah. can enjoy them from anywhere. Um, yeah, exactly. That's, that's really cool. Um, another project that we've been working on with OpenSea um, is about tokenizing um, identity and naming and domain names and and. Um, for people to own art and, and game in-game items, they need to have a digital wallet. And so one of the things we talk about a lot is, you know, how do you get normal people um, to understand what a digital wallet is and what you can put in it? And digital wallets need to be named. Digital wallets need to have short, interesting names. Um, and so with CRED, we've done an integration so that you can take joel.cred and uh, put it in your browser and you'll see information. Or if I want to send a token, an art piece of art or an OpenSea token, mm -hmm. I can send it to joel.cred. And, uh, and Joel has both a wallet um, that's addressed and he also has uh, a web page. And we're about to do a big OpenSea sale, aren't we, Alex, where people can actually go and get their, um, their identities. <laughs> Neat. So we're looking forward to that. So there's Joel. Um, I think we've got like one minute left. Um, <laughs> do you want to jump in, Alex? I think you look like you're going to say something. Oh, no, no, no. Um, it, I'm really looking forward to the cred names because uh, they're novel. Like we, we've seen quite a few blockchain name projects, but none that actually have real DNS control. Mm -hmm. And real DNS control means that you can instantly host a website that every browser can access, not just uh, the, you know, crypto native browsers. We're, we're really? bullish on NFTs, gang. We're, uh, Travis and I are big fans, and we think having you know, a, a name server that uh, you'll be able to collect tokens at your address makes a lot of sense. So. Yeah, where's, where's Travis.cred? What's up with that? Yeah, where's Travis.cred? <laughs> You have done such a great job on this conference, Travis. We'll give you Travis dot credit. Okay, boom. I thought I was I thought I was the stepson for a while. You were. Now you're not. 
<laughs> Jody, Alex, and Vendana, thank you so great. much for joining us today. We appreciate you, and and thanks for uh, sharing the stream with the Cred page on Facebook. We're great. Great y'all. job, great job with the conference, guys. Thanks, y'all. Take care. See you ya. Too. Bye. Bye now. Bye. That's good Bye. stuff right there, Mr. Travis. Right. Definitely good stuff. And, you know what else uh, is good stuff? Zoomf. Zoom is good stuff. Zoom analytics. So you can check it out. Uh, Zoom.com, which is Z O O M P H. It's the smarter way to measure partnerships. It's a platform for social audience intelligence and sponsorship measurement and evaluation. And uh, they are on our partner page. You can go to virtualblockchainweek.com, click on the blue sponsors button up at the top, and uh, you can hit so you can get to that, or you can hit social, which will take you to this page right here which has an influencer leaderboard that showcases the people who are talking about the conference the most. Mm -hmm. the yep. most Use the hashtag VBW 2020 when you are doing that. Also, for those of you that purchase the VIP ticket, half the proceeds of those tickets are going to Binance Charity. The website is Binance.Charity, and we have partnered with them for this effort right here, Crypto Against COVID. Join Binance Charity and help the world fight COVID-19. Even a small donation can help save lives. So whether you got a VIP ticket or not, look at this. They're over, they're almost to $4 million raised on this so far, Travis. All you guys got to do is click that donate button right there. It'll take you to this page and you can, and it's so transparent. Mega transparent even. Well, the background's white. I can't see through it. Oh, I see. You're 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 being funny. This is serious business. Mr. This is serious Chris. business. It's been amazing. These guys, and we're gonna have a chance to chat with CZ today uh -huh. about the donations and all the great things that they're doing. Look at that. 445 Bitcoin have been donated. And the amazing thing about that is is as the price of Bitcoin goes up, the amount of money and the donations are increasing in value. So it's I mean, Bitcoin has gone up what in the last day, a thousand dollars. Thousand dollars, yeah. So that's one of them good really days, Mr. Joe Com. Putting your money to work. Also, want to give a shout out to our lead media partner at Cointelegraph.com. Cointelegraph is where we go for the news, and they are the leading independent digital media resource covering a wide range of news on blockchain tech, crypto assets, and emerging fintech trends. Each day, their team delivers the most accurate and up to date news from both the decentralized and the centralized worlds and everything in between. They're covering this conference and uh, taking notes on what the speakers are saying and then putting out articles here. So go check them out at cointelegraph.com. Is there a way, Mr. Joe, come on that page to hit the search button and then type uh, virtual blockchain week to see if all of those virtual blockchain week articles are in one place? Because that would be pretty handy. There is a way. I click the search bar, I type, and uh, Does it showcase share, them all. Let me share the screen again. That that was actually super smart thing that you said there. Yep, there's uh, Caitlin Long spoke yesterday. There's an article about her. Uh, Ali Sam spoke yesterday. On Monday we had Monty Greenspan and Tim Draper, and uh, there's going to be more. There's going to be content all week long as their journalists cover what's happening here. Copy that world. URL there, buddy. We'll send that over to the team so we can keep track of that. That's great. Boom. Just like that. All right, Mr. Travis, right? Let me see. Uh, there's so much going on here. I want to make sure that we have all our guests in line, all our ducks mm -hmm. in a row. We do. And also, I would like to say this to everyone. If you are watching this on Facebook or not, just go share this on Facebook. Create a watch party. Watch parties are a really good way to amplify the amount of folks who are going to be able to, to check this thing out. So if you go to facebook.com forward slash virtual blockchain week that's our page and if you click on that and click share um, the uh, the watch party or start a watch party to your group or to your page or wherever that's just a really great way to amplify it and it costs costs you nothing and it just helps all your friends become more aware of how the cryptos works exactly. we have some great speakers today you can see it right here on the screen and uh, right underneath the video that's live, watch together with friends or with a group and then you just click start and it works like a share, but you can put in whatever text that you wanna put in to tell people. And, and Facebook really gives preference to watch parties over regular shares. I'm not sure why it's in their algorithm like that, but it is. And uh, we they like to party, I think it's a party party. They like the watch parties, yeah. 
All right, Mr. Travis Wright, I think we're ready to bring in, uh, we've got so many guests tonight that are going to be delivering so much great content. And the gentleman... only, it seems like we're just, we're just beginning the day, but it's like, it seems like we've already had a day because we had this long VIP my, group. That was such an, that was such a fun, fun we time. We did have a day. Those. I took a screenshot of that too. You can see here behind me. These are just some of the people that were in the networking room before we did. Yeah, you the click a plus, you can click the arrow and go to a whole other page of <laughs> this many people. Again, it was just, it was, it was crazy. off the chain and the chain was on the hook, but then it, the chain fell off the hook. So it was off all the things. Mm, wow. Speaking of chains and blocks, we should maybe get to, uh, actually, it's not really a great transition to talk about ATMs, but ATMs are, have been a foundation of money for a long, long time. And our next speaker is going to come in and talk about Cryptomatic ATM. He's our lead title sponsor and going to talk about ATMs past and present. Uh, Joff Paradise is an entrepreneur. He's an investor right. and educator, successful entrepreneur with over 40 years in business, and he's experienced lots of big wins and some devastating losses, but he has seen the light. He's been in crypto since 2010, and uh, he is one of the leading uh, proponents of ATMs so much. In fact, he's got his own Cryptomatic ATM business that he's going to be giving one away today. Yeah. Amazing. Let's do it. Mr. Joff Paradise. It's all you, brother. Hey, guys. Uh, I, again, thank you so much for having us on the show again today. And we appreciate it very much. And how about that Bitcoin? 88 and climbing. I think our next stop or breakthrough will be 92, 93. And we're going to keep on going. Let's hope. Uh, anyway, uh, the Cryptomatic ATM machines are what I'd like to talk with you about today. And we're going to do a little share screen. And I'm going to bring this up. Uh, real quick for you. And let's talk about the Cryptomatic ATMs. Now, we build through listening to you. And what we've done is we've listened to so many people, we're actually going to launch a new program on Friday that will blow your minds on sharing the very first ATM profits. I don't think that's ever been done in the history of ATM machines. I mean, what bank wants to share their, uh, their fees that they make, right? And what was that, 2 billion, I think, last year. So let's see what we can do and, and how we can do that. But we listened to you and we wanted to bring that to you. And Friday, we'll show you a little bit more about that. Uh, so let's move on today. Um, if I can bring up my PowerPoint, sorry about that. Technical difficulty. Um, Sometimes you gotta say, what's the point of PowerPoint? When the power you know? doesn't point. <laughs> there you go. There we go. Okay. So um, let's talk a little bit about the story of Bitcoin and cryptocurrency and, and the ATM and how this started. As some of you might know, you know, crypto ATMs began shortly after the U.S. Uh, investment bank, uh, I believe it was Lehman Brothers, goes bankrupt in 2008 and triggers a global financial crisis. Now, there was a nine-page script right after that was, that appears on the internet and outlines a virtual currency by the name of Bitcoin and a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. Now, if you think about this and, and, and we go into how the history goes, in 2009, in January 12th, Bitcoin exchanged its first, was exchanged for its first time. 2010, Bitcoin exchanges, uh, exchange office goes online. 2010, Bitcoin was successfully transferred or transaction acted between two smartphones. And then in February of 2011, one Bitcoin was worth the same amount as $1. And that was for the first time in history. And then by the end of April, one Bitcoin had risen to $1.20 value and rose over uh, right under $6 right after that. So in October of tw October 29th of 2013, and I love that 29th is a reason behind that, but uh, RoboCoin machine opened the very first ATM in well in uh, Waves Coffee Shop in Van Vancouver, Canada, and the machine is um, believed to be the very first one. Since then, Bitcoin ATMs have grown into a multi-million dollar industry, and companies have operated the machines, collected sizable fees, reporting around well over 8.93%. There's a guy in New York doing about 32%, for instance, in Cottonwood. A firm controlled 91 machines in New York City in December of 2018, and it annually grossed exceed 
$35 million, exceeded $35 million. And about that's about, what, 385000 in cash per machine, and they only had 13 employees. 13 employees. That's pretty phenomenal. So today we have more than around 7,000 cryptocurrency ATM machines in operation around the world. Uh, ATMs, in the last two years, the market has seen a massive growth of about 70% uh, between 2018 and 19. We're just getting launched out here in 2020. And as you know, it's kind of put a little damper on things with our uh, facing this corona, COVID-19, but we're gonna continue to go forward. Uh, we're getting a lot of interest in the ATMs and some, and, and our ATMs are not shut down around the world, which is beautiful because they're operating in grocery stores, uh, you know, some of the, the places, the li al uh, liquor stores and uh, box stores and stuff like that. Uh, the post office box stores are still going. Um, but uh, the country's most ATMs in the U.S. are mostly in the United States. There's around estimated of 4,120 approximately. Canada has about 733, UK about 295, Australia about 193. And this is according uh, last week, according to Coin ATM Radar. Now, if you don't use Coin ATM Radar, um, they're a pretty good source. We, we list our ATMs on there for people to find those. Uh, you, you'll see, um, let me see if I can find this for you real quick. You'll see here, there's uh, about 62 cryptocurrency manufacturers or crypto ATM manufacturers around the world. Um, and about uh, um, operators, about 563. Now, there's a lot of cryptocurrency man people saying they're manufacturing when they're not. They're not the actual manufacturer. And so, they're, of course, their prices are going to be a marked up a little bit more than buying direct from a from us or, or from manufacturers like us. So, uh, but there are around 563 operators according to Coin Radar, Coin ATM Radar. Also, um, so if you'll look at the the top cryptocurrency ATM operations now, uh, you have about 3,529 ATMs, 46%. Uh, and then you have about 550 other operators running about 4,884 ATMs, 53.6% uh, the market share. So if you look on the screen, you can see right here uh, in blue, you've got who they are. Now, some of these we private label. So if you wanted to have your own ATM and you didn't want Cryptomatic on there, of course, we can private label it for you and, uh, and it'll become your own ATM when you buy quantity. Uh, we love doing that with, with uh, different vendors and keep them going. So uh, market share, you'll see that crypto, uh, crypto ATM producers, the top three producers, more than 70% of the crypto ATMs. Uh, this is all, you can find all this in, uh, coin, in coin, market, uh, coin market cap. You can find it on um, uh, coin source and then Bitcoin radar or Bitcoin ATM radar too. Great spots to look at. The Cryptomatic is for everyone looking to generate income and operate an ATM. Cryptomatic offers ATMs to beginning at only 500, uh, anywhere from 500 when it first started. Um, and then we have up to over 4,500, up to 8,000, $16,000 machines even. Uh, when, the, when it first, the ATMs first started, they were a lot less and now they've become more complex because we've had to add more software, more coins, more hardware. Our ATMs are actually manufactured out, uh, soft uh, hardware is in Germany. Uh, so we use a lot of their great components. Uh, wrapping up the cryptocurrency ATM uh, market has just started. If you really think about this, it's really just beginning. We are the pioneers and we see a lot of opportunity ahead. And I'm gonna go over that Friday about the opportunities in the future that's coming with the ATMs. Um, and what the growth is going to be and the interest in the market. I do see that, you know, maybe the stable coins are going to happen with us and stay with us. And then the Bitcoin and the ATM market, I think, is going to be around for a minimum of at least the next five years, if not longer. There are people you have to realize, and, and some of the people have spoken about uh, countries that have don't have ways, they don't have phones, they don't have a way to exchange their crypto. And of course, if you throw in a Bitcoin ATM 
in a market, a supermarket or somewhere like that in, in Venezuela or somewhere where they, the, the vendors or the, the, the merchants can actually exchange their crypto into cash. Uh, cash is gonna be around for a little longer as, as I think uh, for a while longer. And I believe that people are gonna need to cash it out uh, to, to cash their coins out. So there yeah, we go. Joff, you're, you're giving away two of these cryptomatic ATMs for virtual blockchain week. And these are I am indeed super sexy machines right here. I mean, these are sleek and they're cash to crypto and crypto to cash, right? They are. Uh, well, we, the ones we're giving away, the, the majority of the market today wants uh, just to cash out. And the legalities and legal stuff, that sometimes you might do not need an exchange license when you just do a cash in machine. So when you're doing cash in and cash out, that's an actual chain exchange of currency in some countries. So think about that. With a machine that we'll be giving away as a cash out only, so you 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 uh, disregard all the legalities. You'll need a you know it's a, it's a business opportunity. Sure. One of the cool things about these machines too is Joel that those lights, that purple, that green, you can make them any color you want. When you order, when we send you the machine, that you can put it in blue. They're really pretty with blue too. Nice. So, we're going to be giving away the first one of these. Uh, Joff is going to join us after CZ's keynote tonight, and you need to register for Virtual Blockchain Week in order to qualify to win. So if you haven't done so yet, go to virtualblockchainweek.com, get registered, and we'll see you later tonight, Joff, to give away the first of these bad boys. Thanks, guys. Thanks for the time. I appreciate it. I can't wait. It's going to be amazing. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, good sir. Thank Most you. Excellent. I appreciate you, Travis. Joel, we'll see you soon, boss. You bet. Mr. Travis Wright, that's good stuff right there. Can't wait to give one of these away. And mm -hmm. uh, right now, we're going to bring in one of the Bitcoin OGs for our opening keynote. Would you like to give him a proper introduction? You know, very excited about this. And we had a chance to chat with this guy really early on in Aspen in 2017. One of our very first episodes, I think, is in the top first 20 episodes, uh, Roger Ver. And, you know, early on in the crypto days, like there was no bigger proponent of crypto than Roger Ver. He saw it early on. He was one of the main venture capitalists for pretty much every one of those startups that started up early on in the crypto game. He's been a long proponent of voluntarism, the idea that all human actions should be by human consent or not at all. Ver, Ver was an early investor in Bitcoin, Bitcoin related startups. He has been known as Bitcoin Jesus in the past for his promotion of Bitcoin, owner of Bitcoin.com. What an honor to have with us the one and only Mr. Roger Ver. Oh, yeah, the big RV in the house. Roger, go ahead and get your, your camera and your mic turned on so we can see you, we can hear you, as long as we don't have to smell you because we don't know if you showered or not. I mean, a lot of people are stuck inside and, and maybe they have. Maybe I am on have. a four day in a row shower streak. <laughs> I'm very impressed with that. Really, that is super impressive. <laughs> way, way to go. Well, he was in the waiting room here and he might've stepped aside for a moment. He's gonna be back and he's like, oh crap, I'm on, I'm on. Mom, I'm, I've, I've got to go talk to these guys here at the Bad Cryptos. So while we're waiting for him, Mr. Travis Wright, those of you that have already registered, you may not have put your Ethereum wallet address in. And it's super important that you do. And let me give you a quick walkthrough here of what this looks like on the Eventbrite site. So if you've registered already and you did not put in your Ethereum wallet to make airdrops, go to eventbrite.com right here and go to your tickets. And once you're there in tickets, click on the virtual blockchain week ticket and then scroll to where it says edit. Okay, now that you're here, you can go ahead and paste your Ethereum wallet address in here and save it. That's gonna qualify you to get some free NFTs from virtual blockchain week. We wanna make sure that you do that. And now the man is here, Mr. Roger Ver. How you doing, buddy? Fantastic, thank you so much. Good to see you again, it's been a while. Time goes fast. Can hardly believe how fast it goes. I know. What, do you, what are you thinking of the run that's happening right now? Uh, never, ever a boring day in crypto, but I think any the, the price is just the side effect of, of 
the, the adoption happening in actual commerce or the people speculating on the future adoption there. So uh, mm -hmm. I actually don't get excited about the day-to-day -day price volatility, although it's more fun when it goes up than down. That is true. And we're excited to hear your presentation today, good sir. Bringing more economic freedom to the world with digital currencies. And we need more freedom because we're all locked down in our houses right now. And freedom is like a very nebulous thing, it seems. to It's almost like we have permissions to do things more than freedom. So I'm really excited to hear about your presentation today. Do you, do you have a do you have a deck? Or are you going to? I sure do. I have a whole deck and everything. I can put it on. Bring it on up. Bring it on up. Let's go ahead Let's, and do that. I'm excited to see. We got a lot of people watching all over the world waiting to hear what you've got to say. So take it away, good sir. All right, there we go. So uh, I have the wonderful virtual blockchain week uh, start page there. So uh, we're talking about uh, the future of money at Bitcoin.com. That's what we're trying to to do for the world. And my presentation actually today is actually uh, based off of a, a blog post by Brian Armstrong, the founder of Coinbase uh, from a few years back. And his blog post was uh, talking about how digital currencies will change the world. And there's a great quote from Brian here. It says, digital currency may be the most effective way the world has ever seen to increase economic freedom. If this happens, the implications are profound. It could lift many countries out of poverty, improve the lives of billions of people, and accelerate the pace of innovation in the world. And so that's a really, really exciting quote from Brian Armstrong. And it's nice to see so many other uh, early cryptocurrency adopters excited about the exact same things that attracted me uh, to cryptocurrencies as well. So, so let's talk about this whole economic freedom that the whole world doesn't have very much of uh, at the moment, right? We can see everybody's locked down and they're trying to dictate what price you can sell your mask or your hand sanitizer for or any of that other sort of stuff here. And, so uh, we have uh, you know, some definitions here of what economic freedom is, right? So it's a measure of how easy it is for members of a society to uh, participate in the economy. It has a number of factors, such as how easy is it to start a business, whether property rights are enforced, free trade with people in other nations, regulation of labor and business, and the stability of the currency, right? And so we've seen with this coronavirus stuff recently, like they're literally telling people what price they can or can't sell their toilet paper for. And like anybody that studies economics, We'll know that anytime you have price controls, that, leadage, that leads to uh, shortages, right? So uh, you need to have the prices be able to transmit the information as to what goods people want or what goods people don't want. Uh, and if you block those prices from being able to change, you're blocking that information to the economy as to what things uh, need to take place. And then, uh, of course, with fantastic tools like Open Bazaar and local.bitcoin.com, you can literally, and darknet markets as well, you can trade with people uh, all over the world, regardless of what country they're in. It's really, really an amazing thing for the whole world. And then anybody can start their business. Anyone can pay anybody else. At, at Bitcoin.com, we're paying people all over the world. We pay people in Venezuela and Brazil and Russia uh, in Bitcoin Cash. And it's just really, really fun to see that, like, literally, we can pay people all over the world and we don't have to deal with the bank. We don't have to report to the bank, oh, why is he, why are you sending this wire? Oh, we're going to hold it until they give us this information or that information. No, they just tell us their address and we can send it anywhere in the world. And it's just really, really uh, fantastic on, on that front as well. So, and here we can see though, a list of countries around the world uh, ranked by the amount of economic freedom they have. And you can see the countries with the most economic freedom are places like Hong Kong, Singapore, New Zealand, and Switzerland, all fantastic places to live where people from all around the rest of the world would love to move to and, and, uh, and be there. And if you look at the countries with the least amount of economic freedom in the world, it's places like North Korea, Venezuela, Cuba, and the Congo. And like people aren't trying to move there from all over the world. In fact, those are the places where people in North Korea, they literally have to have armed guards to prevent people from escaping because it's so bad. Uh, and so you can see just a really, really stark contrast between the countries with the most economic freedom versus the countries with the least amount of economic freedom. And it's very, very clear uh, which one of those two lists of countries uh, just about everybody listening here would rather live in. Uh, and sometimes uh, a picture is worth a thousand words. So here we can see Hong Kong in the 1950s when it was just kind of a little bit of a sleepy fishing village versus Hong Kong today. That's just an absolutely amazing world-class economic powerhouse. And that wasn't all that long, right? Just a couple of generations, it went from basically nothing to this amazing, amazing city. And for anybody who's ever been to Hong Kong, as soon as you arrive there, you can just feel the economic energy and the, and the power and the pulsing of uh, you know, financial things happening there. Uh, so it's just an amazing, amazing city. And uh, it, I don't think it's coincidence that it's also one of the cities with the most city-states with one of the most uh, uh, amounts of economic freedom in the world over that time. And here we can see uh, Havana, Cuba, over the same time period. And you can see that it didn't actually make all that much progress at all. 
Uh, so you can see on the left in the 1950s versus Cuba today, Havana, Cuba today, not much happened, right? And so I don't think it's just a coincidence that not much happened because it was one of the places with the least amount of economic freedom in the world. So very, very stark uh, contrast between Hong Kong versus Cuba in the same time period. And you can take other examples historically, if you look at, you know, for those of, enough, for those of us that are old enough to remember, East Germany and West Germany, right? So in, in West Germany, you had a whole lot more economic freedom and they were busy producing Porsches and Mercedes and BMWs and Audis and people had a relatively high standard of living and it was a pretty darn nice place. And in East Germany, you had, you know, way, way less economic freedom and just freedom in general. And about the only thing they were able to produce out of East Germany, unlike the Mercedes and Porsches and BMWs from West Germany, all they were able to produce was a great big giant wall to prevent people from being able to escape. And I think that's another really clear contrast where you have, you know, the same, you know, ethnic people, same culture, same natural resources, uh, yet two very, very different outcomes but just because of the difference in uh, the amount of economic freedom uh, there. And so we can talk about why is economic freedom so important? Well, it leads to higher per capita income, higher life expectancy, higher literacy rates, better income for the poorest 10% in society, improved environmental protection, fewer wars and violent conflicts, and higher self-reported happiness of the citizens with less corruption and bribery, like all fantastic things uh, that everybody should be uh, in favor of and excited about. And in fact, we even have some stats here so you can see exactly. So here, uh, in green, the dark green is, are the countries with the most economic freedom. Light green are countries with still a fair amount of economic freedom to yellow in the middle, orange, and then red is the least amount of economic freedom. And you can see very, very clearly that in countries with the most amount of economic freedom, the poorest 10% still earn far, far, far more money than in countries with less economic freedom. And so just ask yourself, would you rather be a poor person in you know, Hong Kong, Switzerland, Singapore, or a poor person in North Korea, Cuba or Venezuela, I and mean, it's, it's so clear that uh, it's better to be a poor person in a rich country than to be a poor person in a poor country, and more economic freedom leads to countries becoming richer. And here we can see the overall income per capita, right? In dark green are the countries with the most economic freedom versus red with the least. Very, very, very clear correlation there. The more economic freedom a country has, the higher the per capita income that country has. And here we can see the adult literacy rates as well. Uh, I don't know if this is cause or effect for, for this one, but uh, the more people know how to read, the, the more economic freedom the country has, or maybe it's the reverse. Maybe the more economic freedom a country has, the more uh, people learn how to read. So, but very, very clear correlation here. And the least economic freedom, uh, the, less, the fewer people know how to read in those countries. And here you can see life expectancy, right? In countries with more economic freedom, people tend to live longer. And not just a little bit longer, like nearly 20 years longer, right? So I'm ju I just turned 41 recently. That's about half of my entire life so far is the average amount of time that people live longer in countries with more economic freedom versus the countries with the least amount of economic freedom. So very, very, very clear uh, correlation there as well. And uh, I think causation as well. And again, unemployment, right? So of course this makes sense. In countries with a whole lot of economic freedom, you don't have to jump through a bunch of hoops or ask for a bunch of permission from a bunch of bureaucrats who you've never met you and they know nothing about your business. You don't have to ask them for permission. You just you know hire somebody and get started and build your business. And so if it's super easy for anybody to hire anybody without getting a bunch of permission, well, guess what? A whole bunch more people will have jobs. And in countries where the government tries to control everything and they have all sorts of crazy rules and regulations and licensing stuff, they make you jump through and pay a bunch of fees and whatnot. Uh, well, guess what? When it's harder to hire people, fewer people will get hired. And we can see very, very clearly here in countries with the least amount of economic freedom, um, far fewer people have jobs, right? A lot more people are looking for work in countries uh, with less economic freedom because it's harder to hire people. And here, uh, you know, people on the internet love to make fun about me saying babies are dying. Well, pick up a, a, a economics book and take a look, right? In countries with more economic freedom, fewer babies die at childbirth than in countries with less economic freedom. So if you want to see more babies survive being born, you should be advocating for more economic freedom around the world because it leads to more babies uh, surviving childbirth. So more economic freedom is good for adults, it's good for young people, it's good for old people, it's even good for babies. And here you can see it very clearly in, uh, in the, the chart there. And then again, if you care about young people, you can see very clearly in the countries with the most amount of economic freedom, you have the fewest number of children in the labor force. And that's not because of you know, laws that politicians passed in the economically free countries. It's because the society was able to become affluent enough in which children no longer needed to work uh, in order to survive. So whereas in countries with the least amount of economic freedom and people are desperately poor, well, guess what? Kids are going to go into the labor force 
right away because when you're, you have a choice between being able to eat or going to work, you're gonna, uh, you're gonna go to work so you can be able to eat. And so you can see very, very clearly the correlation here in countries with more economic freedom, fewer children are in the labor force than in countries with less economic freedom. So if you don't wanna see children working from a very, very young age, you should be advocating for more economic freedom as well. And here we can, uh, I wanna point out, you know, correlation doesn't prove causation, but there's logical reasons to think that there's lots and lots of causation here. And when we see example after example in both theory and in practice of greater economic freedom, leading to better results for rich and poor, young and old, uh, you know, everybody around the world of every race and every culture, uh, we can make some really, really strong inferences. And so that's what brings us to peer-to-peer -peer electronic caches impact on economic freedom, right? Because if you have a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system, it makes it easier for you to start a business, it enforces your property rights, it promotes free trade, it enables freedom of contract, it enables people to opt out of corrupt systems. So like, that's what got me so excited about Bitcoin back in uh, 2011, almost 10 years ago now, was that with peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash on the internet, anybody can now engage in free trade with anybody else. I and mean, what could possibly be more exciting about that? And we've seen the narrative shift a bit over the last few years to this digital gold store of, store of value thing. And like, if you want to participate in it, that's fine. Go ahead and you can do that. But it doesn't bring these same benefits of bringing more economic freedom to the entire world. What brings the benefits of economic freedom to the entire world and the economic growth that enables that are peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash systems, not peer-to-peer -peer store value systems. And so that's why I'm so bullish about any cryptocurrency that works as peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash. And so here we have a fantastic quote about Brian Armstrong and bringing uh, more economic uh, freedom to the world. He says that it will serve as a giant economic stimulus package for the world, accelerate innovation, reduce wars, make the poorest 10% better off, overthrow corrupt governments, and raise happiness. What could make you happier than doing all those things for around the world, right? And that's what peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash systems enable. And that's why I say that Bitcoin cash and digital currencies are the best tools the world has ever seen to accomplish these goals. So if you want to accomplish all those goals, you better get involved with you know peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash systems that enable more economic freedom around the world. Uh, and so that's why I've been so excited in this space for uh, uh, almost 10 years now, all day, every day, uh, whether a lockdown or not lockdown, it's all uh, cryptocurrencies that work as currencies all day, every day. And so if that excites you too, and you want to you know, spread this to the world and bring more economic freedom to the world and make everybody's life better, uh, rich or poor, you know, young or old, uh, tell your friends, right? Set them up with a cryptocurrency wallet. You can get started with Bitcoin Cash. You can get started with Dash, Monero, Zcash, Zcoin, even Bitcoin BTC, if that's what you really want to. But uh, as someone that was using it in my own business, I stopped using it a couple of years ago because I paid more than $1,000 in fees, more times than I can count to move that Bitcoin. And what a lot of people don't realize is that uh, the software engineers behind the future of the Bitcoin roadmap, they want the fees to be high for on-chain transactions. And uh, don't be fooled by that. Uh, pay attention to peer-to-peer -to -peer electronic cash systems if you want to bring more economic freedom to the world. Peer-to-peer -peer electronic store value systems, that's fine if you want to participate in it, but it doesn't really help bring more economic freedom to the world and all the benefits that that brings. So. Anyhow, that's my presentation today. While everybody's on lockdown around the world with feeling a little bit less economic freedom, here's some of the companies that I invested in uh, over the years. So uh, for anybody that doesn't know, I was literally the first person in the entire world to start investing in this ecosystem. Uh, and that's why I've been involved because I wanna bring more economic freedom to the world and I, I want your help to do it. So, and I need your help to do it because it's up to all of us. And so one fast, uh, fun little thing that I have here, once I exit this and stop my screen sharing, what we can do here, is I have a, some peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash here. Anybody with the Bitcoin.com wallet or any other wallet that can scan a private key, if you scan these, each one of these QR codes is a private key and it has $5 worth of Bitcoin cash on it. And so the first person to scan each and every one of these gets $5 worth of Bitcoin cash, just like that, from this piece of paper, through the camera, uh, out to wherever you are in the world watching this live stream, and that has $5 on it. And it's worth pointing out right now, the fees on Bitcoin are about $2 uh, per transaction. So if you, if I were doing this in Bitcoin, you'd claim the $5, you'd have to spend about $2 in fees to get it. So you'd receive $3 in your wallet. And then when you went to spend the $3 in your wallet, it would take another $2 in fees. So the person you were sending the money to would only be able to get $1. And then they wouldn't even be able to spend the $1 at all because it would cost $2 in fees, which they wouldn't even have. So that was the reason why a couple of years ago, I switched to promoting Bitcoin Cash rather than Bitcoin. 
Because from my point of view, Bitcoin Cash is the same version of Bitcoin that I got so excited about in uh, 2011. And so that's not an attack on Bitcoin. That's just a statement of the, the fact of the matter there. And so like saying that gold you know, weighs more than aluminum isn't an attack on aluminum. It's just stating that they're different. So if you want a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system that allows you to send money right over you know, a video call on Zoom to people all over the world, Bitcoin Cash enables that. Bitcoin no longer does. So anyhow, that's, uh, that's why I'm so excited about Bitcoin Cash. If you haven't tried it out today, head on over to Bitcoin.com. If you want to make your own token as well, mint.bitcoin.com. And another permissionless tool that we have where you can buy or sell anything or Bitcoin Cash with any payment method in any country, anywhere in the world with no KYC, no permission from anybody whatsoever. Check out local.bitcoin.com. These are the tools to enable more economic freedom around the world. And that's what we're busy doing at Bitcoin.com. So thank you so much for the opportunity to be able to present and give away free Bitcoin Cash on the live stream here. That was awesome. Thank you so much for that. People were trying to do their screen cap, I'm sure. They're like, wait, hold on. You're moving it. Stop moving it. Wait, I can't. Do you, you want to try and show it again or, or what? <laughs> yeah, well, we can show you. I moved very slowly across each and every QR code, hoping that they would have time. And if you want to make your own gifts like these, you can head on over to gifts.bitcoin.com. And then you can hand these out to trick-or-treaters, or you can give them out as tips at restaurants or, or whatever you want to do. And the really neat part about it is each one of these is a private key. When you make these using bit, uh, gifts.bitcoin.com, bitcoin.com keeps a copy of the signed transaction, not the private key, but a signed transaction to send the money back to you. So if nobody claims this after 30 days or whatever time frame you set, the money goes right back to your wallet. So you don't have to be worried about giving these out as tips to people that aren't ever going to claim them. Uh, the Bitcoin will, cash will come right back to you if the person never bothers to claim it. So it's a really fantastic tool at gifts.bitcoin.com. Uh, and I hope more people will use it to spread peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash around the world. That's great. You know what? I want to tell you this, Roger. Thank you for all you've done for the industry. I know sometimes, you know, sometimes people try to bust your balls, but you know what? You've been out there from the beginning trying to create mass adoption and making people aware of this and what you've done with voluntarism and sort of the libertarian sort of point of view of, hey, we should be able to control our own stuff and we don't need these big banks and intermediaries. We should be able to manage a lot of this stuff on our own and all those companies that you've invested in early on to help build this ecosystem up. I mean, we are all truly indebted to you in some way or form uh, for what you've done. So thank you for all of that. My pleasure. It was fun for me too, Travis. Thank you. And thank you so much for you guys helping spread the word on your podcast and with this uh, block, virtual blockchain week as well. I'm, I'm really thankful to you guys as well. Yeah, well, you know, just like you've gotten some heat, like Travis was talking about for Bitcoin Cash, Craig Wright gets a lot of heat for Bitcoin SV. I'm curious, you know, what are your thoughts on Satoshi's vision? I don't think Bitcoin SV deserves any heat, but I think Craig Wright's lawsuits against everybody and his threatening to sue everybody over patents, I think all that deserves a lot of uh, criticism. Uh, at the end of the day, people should be... And, and the other thing that just doesn't make any sense to me at all there is they're talking about, oh, Bitcoin SV needs to be compliant and obedient to all the laws around the world. Well, if your cryptocurrency is going to obey every law around the world, what do you need a cryptocurrency for? Just use PayPal. The entire point of cryptocurrencies is that by technological design, they're above the law. And whatever laws politicians get together and write doesn't affect the way that the cryptocurrencies work. So that part of Bitcoin SBI I don't understand at all. I wonder well, how is that going to end with Craig? What do you think is, you know, because I understand the suits right now are basically saying he's got to prove that he is Satoshi and that he's got the Bitcoin to pay, you know, these fees. Yeah. I, how is it going to end? I don't know. Stay, stay tuned. <laughs> That's true. And I do believe that Cointelegraph uh, is going, wants to interview you. So I don't know if you got an email or something telling you there's like some zoom where you're going to go in and chat with a, uh, 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 some journalist over there, if you could. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but I think it's. Yep. It's I, I have it on my calendar and I'm, I'm, I'm ready for them as soon as we're done here. Mm. Perfect. They're Rock standing by for you then. Roger Ver, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate you, my friend. Stay bad. Thanks, guys. Take care. And we'll send them over to uh, talk to Cointelegraph right now. And you guys can watch later on Cointelegraph.com for the article that'll be uh, coming out about that. Fantastic. That's great stuff. Thank you. thank you so much, Roger. Mr. Travis Wright, we have a few minutes here before our next guest. And, you know, earlier when we were talking to Bobby Ong from CoinGecko, he mentioned that anybody, you know, could list their own tokens. And he, he said, bad coin. And I said, well, we're going to talk about that a little bit. We've got just a few minutes. I'm going to pull up the website. Maybe you can tell the story of bad coin. For sure. <clears throat> well, one of the things that we, that we discovered about the cryptos is that, 
you know, to mine Bitcoin now is a very expensive operation. You have to have a warehouse full of ASIC miners and you have to really be out there just, you know, investing who knows how much money to try to even get to the point where you can be making money doing Bitcoin. So I think the original, you know, um, you know, sort of peer to peer of Bitcoin has gone away and, it's, it, and the mining has become more centralized. And so one of the thoughts that we did was how do we actually convert this and, and, and flip the funnel a bit and, and make it so, you know, anybody can mine the crypto and not have to have a whole huge, you know, mining farm. And so what we did was we created Badcoin, Badcoin.net. It was a, uh, one, of our, one of our good friends, Marshall Long. Uh, he, uh, him and his team, you know, donated some time and built Badcoin. It's a peer-to-peer multi-chain built on five different blockchain protocols. And so basically what happens is, is if you have a room full of ASIC computers, you're going to be competing against somebody that has a MacBook. And these different algorithms are going to have different difficulties based on the amount of hash that is, is going on. And so we sort of created this thing and we made it open source. And so anyone can take the open source code of Badcoin and then, you know, maybe create a universal basic income token for their own country or a city, or you can use it, whatever. It's a really, it's a really powerful protocol that we've, that we put together. The name is funny. It's Badcoin, but it's really, it's really pretty good. And uh, you can mine it and uh, you can utilize it. We really like to have more people finding ways to utilize this because based on, you know, this is a completely, uh, you know, community driven project. We've not spent, we've not spent uh, money building this. We've not, uh, you know, had anybody pay for anything. It's completely, you know, sort of open source. And it's one of those things you got to do with the SEC. You got to protect yourself. And uh, so we sort of, Hey, put these things together, give it to the universe and uh, maybe somebody can make something of this and help this yeah. thing become valuable. There's no ICO or anything like that. It's just out there for you to mine. You could download the bad wallet from the website and then all the instructions on here for mining on this website. Just go to badcoin.net. There's uh, hundreds of people that have mined Badcoin. There's a whole Badcoin community. There's a Badcoin telegram. It's really a lot of fun. So uh, check it out. Give it a try. Maybe Badcoin is the next Doge. I don't know. It's a community coin, and it's yep. up to you guys to see um, how it works. You can take it, build something with it, and, and, and if the right developer comes along and does something to make it cool, then there might be some value in it someday, but we have no determination over that or any idea of it even being worth anything ever is just a fun project to teach people how blockchain works and that open source protocol could be used in a pretty valuable way you know good sir the uh the world and the work of of the mixed media world is really interesting especially as we enter this uh, brave new world of crypto and blockchain and digital art our next speaker, his name is Veza. He's got a last name, but I don't think he likes to even use it because, you know, it's kind of like, you know, Madonna, right? It's just one name. Veza is his name, right? And, he, and Veza uh, was his name. Oh, he combines photography, painting, body painting, and digital collaging into a single expression. He calls this process Artivo, which has been widely featured on Forbes and on Vice. His uh, collaboration in 2013 with the Bollywood actress Veena Malik reached around 300 million people. And his platform, Art for Crypto, is rapidly establishing new creative standards in the blockchain art space. He actually developed a piece after his first appearance on the Bad Crypto Podcast called Blood on the Podcast Floor, and it has been signed by a, a whole bunch of crypto OGs that uh, he's going to auction off. He wants to raise a million dollars for charity with it. I think everybody's on there. I mean, it, the, the amount of people that signed that thing is insane. He's going to talk today about liberating the creative class via NFTs. Veza, Welcome to Virtual Blockchain Week, our artistic friend. He's got his own artwork there right behind him, too. Oh, that's awesome. Hey, buddy, how hey you guys. doing? I'm good, thanks. How are you guys? Excellent to see you always. And, and I understand you've got a uh, presentation to share. We're going to let you take it away. Thanks, Joe. Nice to see you guys. Uh, so, uh, I don't know if you did an introduction or not. Uh, so, my name is Vesa, and I'm an artist and a writer. I've been a digital artist for about 12 years already. 
and very, very focused on the world of cryptocurrencies, if not only cryptocurrencies, for the past three years. And I'd like to start this whole thing with um, uh, something that is very obvious to me, but not might not be obvious to other people in crypto from an artist's point of view, is that there are no um, sort of uh, pro Wall Street artists. And at the same time, there are no anti-Bitcoin artists. And what this really means is that there's not a precedent in history that I can think of where a whole legion of artists are behind a movement and especially if that movement is about money and resources and that kind of a thing because it's a little bit of a taboo thing in the, in the art world to begin with uh, so it's a slightly counterintuitive thing um, to think of artists as a resource for businesses and, and this whole space because uh, traditionally we've been um, and for a long time now reserved for a certain kind of political uh, elitist class and narrowingly so to the to the radical left in a certain kind of way and uh, the institutions of the art world have gone you could see a lot of parallels to what's happened to the media as to what's happened to the art world in it in a sense and what I'm attempting to do with this talk is to wrap up uh, the perfect storm of a bunch of things that are happening now in the uh, whole um, crypto community space. I was a little bit freaked out for a little bit because I wasn't sure if this had, this had frozen because I see Joel is frozen uh, in front of me, but I'm sure it's on. So uh, basically when you think of uh, computers and our history with computers, uh, we have uh, grown accustomed to knowing them as machines that are very good at replicating things. And especially the whole of the uh, past 20 years, they've, um, they've copied our um, movie files, they've copied the songs, they've copied uh, our JPEG images, and it's a little bit counterintuitive to start to think all of a sudden of a JPEG image as a sole unique uh, new asset that can have attached uh, value attached to it. And right now, if you start to talk about digital art, the majority of the people, and even those who are into Bitcoin and crypto, um, who are already uh, quite accustomed to digital assets, they they have some sort of a cognitive dissonance a little bit when it comes to crypto art as a similar kind of um, class of value. And in a, in a sense, from an artist's point of view, that is quite bizarre because uh, in many platforms, let's say like Super Rare, you only have art pieces that are um, made once, they're unique. Uh, not 21 million, but one. And you have these prominent artists who've crafted a name of some along decades who are now contributing their value into these kinds of things. And it's a, uh, it's quite a thing. But one of the arguments that often comes up then is like, well, what's it backed up by? Where could I show it? And, and I hope to answer those uh, things in a little bit. But before then, I need to go back uh, a little bit more in order to make sense of this. And as well as the politically... Uh, sort of um, reserved narrow bandwidth. Uh, there's some problems that we have with the physical art world. Like um, if it, one industry known secret is that in Sotheby's and Christie's, which who really have the biggest guns to actually make sure that an art, art piece is authentic, even in their catalogs, the, the industry secret is that up to 50% can be fakes. And let's say if you have a Jackson Pollock, uh, the guy who is the foremost expert on Jackson Pollocks right now refuses to verify any more of them because simply because of the amount of frauds that are out there. And you have these Chinese sort of art render farms now and all, all kinds of things and, that are highly problematic for you to know that that art piece is coming from where it's uh, coming from. And of course, crypto art solves a bunch of uh, these problems. And uh, to further go along to something, uh, my parents' generation, the boomer generation, they took uh, ownership for granted uh, that they would more, more than likely own their houses and uh, have at least 2.5 cars as well as kids and if not more. And my generation of Generation X, we grew up in an atmosphere where we're not at all uh, comfortable uh, and secure knowing that we might own a house or a bunch of other things. So we're the gig economy people and, and it, it seems that it's gotten weirder and weirder and people have like $500 maximum at their um, sort of reserve for uh, any accidents let alone savings and things like that in America I hear about 50% of the people. Uh, so there's this side of things uh, that is now coupled to this um, 
uh, separation of physical and digital. And for me, I've been operating in the digital realm for about uh, 20 years uh, already. So it, I was just waiting for these solutions to come along because for me, that's the digital dark ages to a, uh, to a relative degree. And where you might be able to showcase some of these NFTs, these uh, crypto assets that you're buying that are, are digital is for example, crypto voxels. Uh, this is a whole place where a lot of the desires and needs of the generation X and further are now starting to be met because they can own their fancy cars and plots of land and, and these um, very fantastical places and, and decorate them with art and uh, these sort of adorable, pixelated shoes or whatever it is. And it, it's at a very um, sort of um, beginner's phase in a certain kind of way, but you can also already see that the human psychology is transferring one-to-one uh, -one and more into the digital realm already. And these digital museums like Mokda are being built uh, uh, as we speak and, and the transition is in, in full swing in that kind of a way. Um, so, um, and you, you could say that uh, also these kinds of conferences, I mean, this virtual blockchain week is one of the best examples of a whole new thing relating to COVID. And one of the thoughts that I had is that there's no reason for big, these big conferences that are only now happening annually to be so anymore, because we're going to be more accustomed to being uh, accessing these things from home with our virtual reality goggles. And, and uh, let's say if a big conference builds their whole space in the virtual reality, they can start hosting them as meetups uh, on a weekly basis, as opposed to every other year. So we're, we're doing big, big transitions into the virtual realm already. And of course, these names are crafted now and some of the first mover uh, sort of benefits are there because uh, for the sole reason of people laughing at uh, digital art right now as an asset class or not even being on their radar is why it has many similarities to, let's say, the very, very early Bitcoin. Uh, those opportunities of holding on to the first 10x and the 100x and the 1000x and those kinds of things and most people having folded, uh, they're now going on in crypto art and in these sometimes unique and limited edition assets. And uh, in a one way you could say, because there's a bunch of people who are creating in, in uh, digital ways, you have virtual reality that is coming in, you have illustration, you have painters, you have uh, all these, uh, a variety of uh, augmented reality uh, expressions are in a sense crypto art because they will very likely be um, monetized via crypto solutions. So you could say that crypto is going to be the foundation of this whole movement that essentially I'm arguing here with everything that's come before it and the way that this is happening, it's so, so much more than a, a traditional crypto art movement that it's really a liberation of a whole creative class who are not accustomed to uh, having a whole bunch of re resources and not something seen as something that can be very useful from a business side, from a philosophy side, from all of these kinds of things and how to help a whole evolution of humanity come about in a very different kind of way. Uh, so, and, and to, because I was just listening to Tika Tawari as well, his newest, newest talk about something that reminded me uh, of a thing at the precipice of, the, of this new bull run now, is that the last time, the peak of the bull run, we went to about 800 billion or something like that, and we came back to about 200. And now, uh, in his opinion and many others, we might be going into uh, the trillions. Uh, so it's not beyond the realm of possibility, as crazy as that sounds. Uh, but that also, of course, means that there's going to be at least 10x the volume of people who are coming into crypto and they will have crypto and they're going to want to spend it on something and very likely 10 times the volume of, of interest into crypto art will now also enter into the space uh, via the next uh, now it seems looming bull run. And uh, that's something interesting to keep in mind because a lot of these artists who've, who are already prominent uh, names and the ones who are emerging, who are really putting together a lot of thought and a lot of uh, beautiful expression into the space are already there. And they're not hard to find as investments. And on another kind of level, which, what is really cool is that you have these kids, you have a whole bunch of kids who are basically just throwing shit at a window and seeing what sticks. And, and I, I can't help but to remember what I was like when I was 20 and really 
uh, got into Photoshop and things like that. If I could have gotten like $30 for a digital creation that I made back in the day, oh, what a different kind of reality this would have been if I was able to grow with that kind of a um, solution, which I didn't have for 20 years, almost. And uh, that's that's something to behold. There's a, in that sense, the crypto art realm is that it's a little bit unsophisticated. There's a lot of um, things that haven't transferred over from the legacy world. And in some ways, that's beautiful uh, because people are just looking at the expression. But it's also there's a little bit of sophistication that is lacking. Uh, uh, that is another kind of well, a little bit of a hindrance in, in the, uh, the case of those of us who have been uh, here for a long time sometimes, but also there is opportunity there. And in order to really uh, showcase the capacity of what, uh, what NFTs are, because there really isn't anyone else who's doing uh, something in the scale and scope of what we're now doing with another phenomenal artist called Mani Alota, uh, we are um, basically doing a collaboration uh, and that I, I really wanted to put a lot of ideas into this to showcase what is possible to do in one uh, crypto art NFT. And uh, in order to do so, I started getting um, these uh, sort of flashes of what really is interesting to me. And uh, I, for, for a long, long time, I looked into the work of John Anthony West, who's an Egyptologist, uh, and as well as Graham Hancock, who's another one who's an adventurer, their whole life's work as well as Randall Carson now, who's a geologist. And basically, um, oh, and also this phenomenal documentary called The Revelation of the Pyramids. And uh, th they, they dwell into a couple of very, very interesting ideas. Uh, first and foremost, that there was a cataclysmic event about 12,000 years ago that was on such a scale of destruction and these flood myths that prevail all over the world uh, from that kind of a period that now we're starting to have these discoveries like Gobegli Tepe, this uh, site that can be confirmed that is 12,000 years old, that sort of throws a giant monkey wrench into history. Uh, so this cataclysmic event, as well as that we might have had a whole unified culture all around the world in a very different kind of way as we're uh, sort of uh, mainstream uh, history now uh, teaches us. And basically what that leads up to is that we have collective amnesia about our past that sort of bleeds into our psychology because we don't remember who we are and where we're coming from. Uh, but there are the, the, a lot of these, uh, let's say the Mayan calendar and, uh, and a bunch of these cultures, what they point to is this, what Plato called it, the, the great year, the 26,000 year elliptical cycle that the earth is on that all of these uh, ancient cultures had some references to, and the Sphinx points to the constellation of Leo, and, and it's, a, it's a crazy amount of uh, information to share, but that's only a quarter of this substance of this art piece. So uh, when we come out of that into the present and we start to seeing all of the different uh, threats of what we now have, we still have our finger on the nuke, we're building fossil fuels and destruct destroying nature, we have uh, uh, the control societies, all of these uh, totalitarian ideas of where we might be going uh, into dystopias and so forth, which will be presented, and then uh, finishing off with something that is positive and thinking where we are, what technology, and especially with uh, crypto solutions, can we now utilize to build the true tree of life, and knowing that a lot of the smartest guys in the room, what they're really saying is that we are becoming now an uh, interplanetary species. And uh, I thought, well, okay, well, if, they, if we truly have this threat still that apparently we use only the annual budget of what it takes to run a McDonald's for a year in monitoring the skies, and apparently it's a busy sky. Uh, so we have these pandemics, we have a, a bunch of different threats of how we might like really have something bad happen. So what would be our responsibility to do? What, what's the next possible thing that we could do in order to uh, make sure that we back up the information so we don't have another library uh, uh, burning like the Alexandria library burning with all of the information that is there. And in the crypto community, we constantly talk about going to the moon. We talk, oh, this and that will moon and this, uh, whatever. And I just thought, well, a, a little bit of research, uh, my friend Jamie said that it basically takes 1.2 seconds to go to the moon and back as a signal. Uh, we already have the Blockstream satellite that is backing up the, uh, the Bitcoin monitoring. And basically, why not make a, some sort of an effort to put something on the moon that is a, a mirror of our internet, an, an uncensored 
whole um, database that should something bad really happen, everything is, is in real time backed up to the moon pretty much. Uh, so as crazy as this sounds and, to, and, and further once we, once we go somewhere. So it really, this NFT, this art piece is attempting to showcase our collective amnesia, our present threats and the positive and the beauty and the future all at once. And this is what we're cramming in with money and his, his mastery because he's, he's a sort of storytelling uh, lunatic like I am uh, and it, it's such a positive thing I just get chills uh, with it as well as concepts like what I have behind me like is this is a, a digital art piece uh, originally that is behind me and then I print them three times only and repaint on top of them to make them unique and basically I solved the problem that I had that most people aren't really that interested about what makes art valuable and those kinds of things so I reversed the psychology and said this is stable art so the price of them is tied to Bitcoin. That is one Bitcoin now bought commercially from me and it'll be also one Bitcoin after the now coming bull run. And you can think of what those um, implications are with regards to the value of the art. But of course, if all three of them, let's say, have sold after a while, that means that if someone wants them, no one's going to part from them for less than a Bitcoin. Because the potential of art is to go parabolic, kind of like Bitcoin. So even though you might have bought it for a Bitcoin, you might get 10 from it, as opposed to it being a depreciating asset. So those are some of the potential uh, that is going on with that. With regards to the Bad Crypto podcast and our previous collaborations and this fantastic um, uh, project that we did together, Blood on the Podcast Floor, this art piece that is unique, uh, that has over 50 uh, influencer signatures going from Vitalik and Charlie Shrem and, and uh, Charles Hoskinson and, and further, basically uh, now it's in custody uh, somewhere so it's not even in the same country as me and uh, oh yeah there it is fantastic and those are the uh, those are the signatures so basically we figured out a way in how to keep this uh, project alive with the pandemic because that is also a digital file before it got printed and painted uh, once so now openlaw.io uh, kindly provided me with a template so we can start the digital signatures and them rolling in and especially getting a lot more uh, female influencers to sign this piece because essentially we're attempting to get over a million dollars donated to Hawk, which is the Houston Women's Center that is fighting against uh, physical and sexual violence towards women. And uh, uh, that's, that, that's a unifying uh, crypto project uh, that uh, is, is, is something that I'm very privileged to be a part of and, and glad to do with you guys. And uh, yeah. It's, you can find me at artforcrypto.com and uh, uh, Twitter and Instagram is art by Vesa, B E S A. And I like to have these conversations, even if it's just to say hello and help people understand what this whole thing is about. It doesn't have to be about buying art or anything uh, sort of serious like that. I'm happy to just help this space grow. Mm, that was great, Vesa. And check this out. You'll, you'll appreciate this book. Magicians of the Gods by Graham Hancock talks about go blecky, go, go blecky tepe, however the hell yeah. you say it. Yeah, that, that was a really interesting rabbit hole to see that humanity was around 12 to 14,000 years ago and they basically just buried it to hide it and it was completely hidden. And it's the, there's this whole huge area in Turkey that uh, has been unexplored and uh, fascinating stuff. Thank you so much for coming in, brother. Thank you so much for having me. And I'll shoot you a documentary called Revelation of the Pyramids. I know you will fucking love it, brother. I love that stuff, man. I, I, that's, that's one of the reasons why I, I'm sort of here. It's like I love to explore things. I, wanna, I just try to find the truth. And I know that you're the same way. And I appreciate that about you and uh, you and your, and your spiritual journey that you've been here as a, as a human experience this time. And I think that you're doing some amazing stuff. And we need more people out there exploring and trying to find the actual truth. And as you said, a lot of it's been hidden from us. We don't even really know how powerful we are. Uh, well, the love comes right back to, to the both of you. I'm so happy to know you and that we've become better and better friends. And I hope this continues and the, the search for truth does as well. Thanks, Vaza. Make sure you say hi to your lovely lady for us. Will do. And, and uh, while Beza was, you know, doing his thing, I actually did venture forth to the moon. Travis and I hopped in our Lambo and uh, that's what we've been doing. I'm really concerned about that. Is there enough oxygen in there? That's kind of small. I don't know. I, I like to suck lots of oxygen. Yeah. You might die before me. <laughs> All right. Hate suit. We'll see you later, Vezza. Thanks, man. Thanks, Cheers, guys. Take Thank care. you. That's some good stuff right there, Mr. Travis, right?
That is true. Also, some good stuff is our sponsor. I want to give a, shoot, a sweet shout out to Trader Cobb. In case you missed it, Trader Cobb was on, I believe, on Monday. You can go back and watch it on the Bad Crypto Facebook page. And very soon you'll be able to rewatch all the stuff here on virtualblockchainweek.com. And uh, Trader Cobb was founded in 2019 with the purpose of educating people on trading in the space of crypto. It separates itself from the crowd by bringing experience, simplicity, and confidence to trading education. They're on a mission to help everyone become the best trader that they can. And that's good news because trading the cryptos is hard because crypto goes up, crypto goes down. And if you don't have a good Sherpa to help you understand it all, you could get hosed. So get started now. They have a, they have a really good trading course uh, and it's at VBW20, VBW20.com forward slash trader. And uh, also if you go to the sponsor page, go to virtualblockchainweek.com click on the blue sponsor you get a special conference deal from trader Cobb. so good stuff absolutely and i uh, want to give people a reminder if you haven't registered yet go to virtualblockchainweek.com register we're going to be giving away the first of two cryptomatic atm machines after cz's keynote tonight also please 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 we're asking one favor of you this uh, event is free here's the favor Go to the site and click this blue sponsors button up here. When you do, you're going to be helping us and you're going to be helping our sponsors. Each of them is listed here with their own unique special offer. And you're going to find giveaways on here. You're going to find freebies. You're going to find opportunities. You're going to discover some great products and services that you didn't know existed. So please take a moment, go to virtualblockchainweek.com, click the sponsors button and, uh, and check out all the cool products and services that are supporting this event, bringing it to you, making it possible. Yeah. So it's, there's a big shout out to our team uh, who helped make all that happen because they've been working hard. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that goes on trying to put on a, a week long virtual blockchain conference. Most of the time you notice people do a virtual conference. It's like a day, two days. <laughs> We're like, pfft. We're going to do five days and we're going to actually add on a day on each end with lots of other stuff. And then also on Saturday are the blockchain influencer awards mm -hmm. that you're going to want to tune into. So this does not end on Friday. It can, the party party continues through Saturday and there's going to be a lot of really interesting categories and interesting winners that you maybe have never even heard before, but you get to hear me say interesting. And every time you do, you have to take a drink. You got to take a drink. And every I, time you, know, you hear Joel say absolutely or hunkering and bunkering, you must take a drink. That's also. two drinks. Two drinks That's right true. There. So there is in the history of bad crypto, one guy that while we were interviewing him, the conversation was so fascinating that the moment we were done, we said, we're, you got to come back and, and, you know, be a guest again, because he's absolutely brilliant. He's got some super keen insights. His name is Samson Williams. He's a classically trained anthropologist, finance and public health expert who advises Fortune 100 companies, executives and startups in Dubai, Washington, D.C., Dublin, Ireland. His focus is helping firms understand the latest human trends in fintech, cannabis, alternative investments, blockchain, AI, health, and digital transformation so that they can make some profitable decisions for their bottom line. His company is Axes and Eggs. You actually heard from his partner, Maureen Murat, yesterday on day two of Virtual Blockchain Week, and we could not be more thrilled. Your mind is about to be blown by Mr. Samson Williams. Samson, welcome to Virtual Blockchain Week. Hey, hey, Joel and company. Nice to be here. Uh, your company, Travis. I'm company. I'm just, I'm just curious who has the best mohawk in the crypto space, Samson or Rice Crypto? <laughs> I'm going to give it to Rice Crypto. And I loved you as Mike Tyson earlier, by the way. <laughs> Hey, thank Mike Tyson you. might make another appearance here. Maybe he'll uh, come, maybe he'll come uh, in your outro. Probably. Yeah. Awesome, Samson, you, awesome. you've got some slides, right? Oh, I do have some slides. I should figure out how to share that, right? Yeah, just uh, go to your share screen at the bottom and pick the window that your PowerPoint or keynote is in, and those will pop up on the screen magically. And uh, we're going to turn it over to you right now, good sir, so that you can share your wisdom with our global audience. Awesome, awesome. I, I guess I'm on right now because Joel has turned off his camera. And you you away, are bro. on. Yeah, just oh, hit okay. the uh, the start sl slideshow thing and that'll take you so you don't have to show the whole PowerPoint uh, interface. Okay. Yeah, where is that? It's under tools, I think, or 
Where do you do the slideshow thing? I think it's under view. Under ah, yes. view. Present. Present. There we oh. go. We are masters of technology here, I assure you. Boom, shakalaka. <laughs> great, great. I'm super excited to be here with the good folks uh, from Bad Crypto. Thank you all for staying bad with us this fine evening. So I'm going to give you a little bit of context because in 2019, I uh, made some predictions for a blockchain business magazine. A uh, shout out to Ross McDonald because he's always doing awesome things. And I'm going to just be honest. Part of that was because I was being greedy, being selfish, and I wanted to buy an apartment building for half off. In order to do that, you have to sort of predict where the market's going to be. So I made a few predictions for 2020. Um, and I guess the biggest prediction is that uh, the time Jeff Bezos built out America. So of course, at the time when I made this prediction, it was like, that's the craziest, stupidest thing I've ever heard, Samson. And I was like, maybe, maybe, maybe not. And just for some historical context, uh, once upon a time uh, in 2008, I was the emergency manager for a small company called Fannie Mae. Uh, you might've heard of them. They once tried to ruin the world. And so I started there for 90 days. It lasted eight years. So I I rode that rodeo. I rode that tornado through the 2008 recession uh, there at Fannie Mae trying to help them get back uh, to business. And so thinking about how cyclical recessions are, I was like, hey, let's do a thing. Let's make a prediction about that time Jeff Be Bezos bails out America. And I put the time at 2022 for a variety of reasons. Uh, if you follow the hashtag, hashtag uh, 2018 recession, you can see all my rantings about how we're going to be in a recession, how we technically started a recession in Q3 of 2018. We're just now noticing it. I will say that I did not anticipate that we would have a pandemic, um, but regardless, this is uh, hand grenades, not horseshoes, so I'm pretty close. So I just want to pop out of this for one moment because you can actually see this article. I know they said, don't let you see the whole thing, but that's okay. Where is this at? It's right. There, boom. If you go to Blockchain Business Magazine, you can read the whole article. I won't bore you to death with it, but I will summarize it with you uh, very briefly um, because I think it is important that we talk about this because there is uh, that historical precedent for why uh, Jeff Bezos is gonna bail out America and why we in the crypto space really care about this because we're movers, we're shakers, we're disruptors, and this is very important. Uh, just for your market awareness. So uh, three predictions. In 2022, Jeff Bezos builds out America. And of course, the first question is, why would he do that? Well, Amazon just needs customers first and foremost. And if anything, the pandemic has shown us that America needs prime. You've probably seen their little steel blue Amazon trucks going around delivering whatever things you've ordered courtesy of this handy dandy mall that's in your hand. And so Amazon is sort of like critical infrastructure. So there's a reason that Jeff Bezos bails out America, not only because he's the richest person on the planet, but also because Amazon needs customers. And so in 2024, Jeff Bezos becomes president, becomes POTUS, president of the United States. Okay, you're like, Samson, that is so crazy. Remember, I wrote this back in December of 2019, but there's historical president for that. Um, part of it is uh, there's a company called Amazon and Microsoft, and they're beefing over this 10 billion contract called Jedi. And that's for cloud services to the Pentagon. And unfortunately, or fortunately for everyone, uh, the president of the United States, uh, Trump 45, him and Jeff Bezos don't always get along. They have a long history of beefing. And so the rumor mill has it that the president intervened on behalf of Microsoft's, on behalf of Microsoft to prevent Amazon for get, from getting this Jedi contract um, and they intervened because uh, Jeff Bezos owns a newspaper called the Washington Post. And this gentleman named Jamal Khashoggi, he worked at the Washington Post. Uh, he was dismembered. He was killed and dismembered in Saudi Arabia. And you know what? I'm hearing myself talk and it sounds super conspiratorial. So just bear with me. You'll understand how this all comes together. Um, I, this isn't actually a mohawk. I have a tinfoil hat on top of underneath this. And so Jamal Khashoggi and M uh, Crown Prince MBS, they had beef. Uh, MBS is Mohammed bin Salman. He's the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia. And Saudi Arabia is a staunch ally of the United States. And uh, the Crown Prince MBS is good friends with, depending on the day, uh, good friends with uh, our president, Donald Trump. So they have that historical beef, as well as, again, 
Uh, Jeff Bezos owns the Washington Post and the Washington Post uh, is always quoting the president and chiding him. So there's always been some historical beefs between the two. So you just got to keep that in mind as to why this is, isn't as crazy a thought as you might think. So as we're popping back over to this, just keep in mind, Amazon needs customers, America needs prime. There's historical contacts to be like, why would Jeff Bezos run for president? Because of uh, the Washington Post, the historical beefs with the current president. And what do you do when you're the richest man on the planet? What left is there to talk about at the country club? You gotta run for office, of course. So that last and final prediction is that in 2030, Amazon replaces the Federal Reserve. And so we're talking about the, the Federal Reserve banking system, or the uh, Federal Reserve Bank. And of course, it's like, hey, that's crazy, Samson. That makes no sense. Uh, but you might be old enough. I don't know if you can zoom in and see my gray hairs. Uh, once upon a time, there was an amazing company called Sears Robux. You probably got their catalog. You flip through it. You got your school clothes. It was the dopest thing out, right? Sears Robux. Uh, and then one day, this small company called Amazon put a wrap uh, clip came out into the industry and it took about 20 years to put uh, Sears Roebuck out of business, but Amazon did a brilliant job of doing that. Uh, so much so that many of your listeners don't even know what Sears Roebuck is, but Sears used to be a beast. And why, of course, are we talking about this old antiquated uh, gone dead company? Well, when we talk about the Federal Reserve, we have to talk about banking. And so the crazy thing about banking is that banking works best without banks. Uh, I was sitting in uh, Dubai and talking to this guy named Ali, of course, he's from uh, the Lebanon. And he asked me, hey, Samson, do you know where the word banking comes from? And I was like, Ali, I have no clue. And so he was saying that uh, the Jewish people used to sit on the river Euphrates to do their business, which was lending money. And so you would go to the banks of the river to get money. And I was like, Ali, that sounds almost like it might be true. And so I give you this context so you understand that banking is a verb. Banks are a noun. Banking, the verb, it works a whole lot better when you get rid of the, the noun, when you get rid of the institution that is a bank. Banking actually works better on your phone. Uh, most people do actually bank on your phone. Even now, when we talk about, hey, we're going to create digital currencies, 98% of money currency is already digital, particularly if you've got direct deposit or if you've got a stimulus check. Uh, well, you probably haven't actually got a stimulus check just yet, but if you had direct deposit, you got your digital monies in there. So what that means is banking works best without banks. And who has better customer service than Amazon? Who could provide you with better banking services than Amazon? So of course, we wanna talk about the historical presidents. And of course, if we're gonna say, hey, Samson, you're talking crazy. I don't understand how Jeff Bezos can bail, bail out America. We have to actually go back in our history books. And of course, I welcome you all to fact check me. Uh, get on the Googles, get on the Bings, get on the Yahoos, whatever uh, web you search, web engine you use to search. And check out the time JP Morgan, the first time JP Morgan bailed out America in 1883. We're talking about JP Morgan, the man, not JP Morgan Chase, the conglomerate of banks, just JP Morgan, the man. Because at one point, he was the richest person. Uh, in the US. And so in 1883, JP Morgan bailed out the, the US. Then again in 1907, JP Morgan pulled out his checkbook and did it again. And it's like, oh, that's so crazy, right? I know history, it's a beautiful thing. I think Mark Twain said that history doesn't, uh, rhyme, doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. And so there is that historical precedent for a single individual, in this case, Jeff Bezos to bail out America because it's happened on three separate occasions. And the most important occasion is in 1913 when JP Morgan and a few of his other banker friends got together and decided to bail out America. But they, JP Morgan and his friends, he was on his deathbed at the time. They decided that they'd done this one too many times, right? Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. The third time they're like, we need to create the Owen Glass Federal Reserve Act of 1913. And the Owen Glass Federal Reserve Act of 1913 actually created the Federal uh, Reserve Banking System and the Federal Reserve Bank. So actually, much like Sears Robux, uh, the Federal Reserve is a 107 year old uh, startup. It's been around a minute and is looking for someone to disrupt it. And so you're saying, Samson, that is the craziest thing. I'm like, no, no, 
Jeff Bezos could bail out America because we're anticipating a full-fledged recession. Again, I was being greedy. I wanted to buy a couple of apartment buildings. Uh, I've since put that dream on hold because I didn't anticipate a depression. Uh, we currently have around 20% unemployment. We're heading towards 30% unemployment. It's very FUBAR. That's really the technical term for our current condition because uh, we're going to have to figure out how to get back to work. And so we have the historical context where a single person has bailed out America. And so we have the historical context or the historical beef for Jeff Bezos to have political ambitions. Oh, excuse me. And last but not least, it is entirely possible that by 2030, Amazon replaces the Federal Reserve. Because here's the crazy thing. When money, our currency, becomes a matter of faith, then it's really a question of who do you have more faith in? The full faith and credit of Uncle Sam or the full faith and credit of Amazon? Because remember, Amazon needs customers and America needs prime. And since we're in the crypto space and we're saying, hey, something's going to replace the US dollar, well, what do you think it's going to be? Is it going to be Bitcoin? Is it going to be Dogecoin? By the way, love Dogecoin. Uh, this is not an endorsement. Do your own research. But if you believe that something will replace the US dollar, because uh, most recently we printed out uh, between two and $10 trillion worth of stimulus, but we didn't actually have a plan to pay it all back. So what is going to replace the US dollar? Because right now, faith is just a matter of, I'm sorry, money, in air quotes, is just a matter of faith. So will it be Bitcoin? We don't know. But courtesy of our good friends here at, well, we've got to go here first, because I made a couple of predictions about China's blockchain strategy. Again, you can fact check all this, go to Blockchain Business Magazine. This is from December 17th. I'm gonna read you these three bullet points uh, just to drive home this point. Uh, China adopting blockchain means nothing for the value of Bitcoin. It means even less for the value of your portfolio. When China launches their national cryptocurrency, they will ban Bitcoin mining and production of mining equipment. It hasn't happened yet, but stay tuned. Our good folks from Cointelegraph are gonna tell you why that's possible. Uh, and then blockchain is a surveillance state's wildest dreams come true, which is 100% true, particularly if you're China, China, you wanna track all of your tran transactions. And what better to do that on than a state blockchain, a government issued blockchain. And then last but not least, China will determine 70% or more of the, of the emerging market cybersecurity encryption blockchain and AI adoption via its Belt and Road Initiative. And so, China has a Belt and Road Initiative. They kicked it off in 2014. Uh, as of about 20, as of January 2020, they'd invested in over 70 plus 70 plus countries, somewhere between four and eight trillion dollars. Uh, it gets a little funky when we try to determine China's investment, but remember, there's a lot of billions in one trillion, and so over, since 2014, they've invested somewhere between four and eight trillion dollars around the world. And when they make those investments, they also bring their, their surveillance system with them, their state surveillance mechanism. So again, you can read that whole article here on Blockchain Business Magazine. Uh, oh, let me get rid of that. There we go. And so why this is important that we have a little bit of context to blockchain, to China's blockchain strategy. And again, this was written in December of 2019 because I was just on a roll. It brings us up to our favorite coin telegraph, the future of money. I recommend you guys read them because I consume a lot of their information. Is of course you want to be up to date. And so this is from April 15th. It's so old, it's already in print. It's 14 days old. China's digital yuan reportedly to test in four cities. And so China's already rolling out their digital yuan or digital uh, currency. Is it a cryptocurrency? I don't know yet. There's not enough uh, information to tell. But remember, when money becomes a matter of faith, and we do believe something will replace the US dollar, why not the digital yuan? Or more importantly, um, and again, I'm just going to show you this here. Uh, you guys get a chance to go to cointelegraph.com. This came out four days ago. Um, in Shenzhen, Shandong, Zhuhou, and Zhaogang, uh, those are the four cities that are testing the digital yuan, and it's important to remember this because China appears to be accelerating the development of their digital yuan, notwithstanding the COVID-19 crisis. China's 
want a lot of soft power. They want a lot of brownie points because yes, the virus did originate in Wuhan. However, China has been at the forefront of providing aid, providing distribution, providing PPE to the rest of the world. Because you can get a lot of uh, digital adoption done through a little bit of soft power. Remember when I mentioned the Belt and Road Initiative where in over 70 countries, they'd invested between four and $8 trillion before the virus? Guess what they're doing now? They're strengthening, they're strengthening those relationships um, by providing PPE and rolling out a digital uh, dollar, a digital yuan, because guess what they're gonna make loans for for the rest of the decade? You're gonna get loans from uh, digital, you're gonna get loans in your digital yuan in those 70 plus countries in the emerging markets. So this is all very important because again, when money becomes a matter of faith, the question is, what's gonna replace the US dollar? Bitcoin, digital yuan, are the Amazon token. Because remember, as we pop right over back here, we have that historical president where the Federal Reserve banking system was created. And so we're gonna be thinking about what does that look like when Amazon says, hey everybody, we're Amazon, we provide you with great customer service. You're already a customer of ours. We're gonna do the largest ICO in the world where for every one US dollar token, we will give you four Amazon tokens. So you're gonna trade your fiat US dollar for four Amazon tokens and you can buy uh, anything in Amazon's ecosystem with your Amazon tokens. There'll be some semblance of blockchain based uh, digital currency. And remember, when we say Amazon, we don't just mean Amazon. We mean Amazon and the dozen other company, the dozen other billion dollar companies Amazon owns, like Audible, as well as Zappos and a small place called Whole Foods. Amazon already has that ecosystem where you can literally use a token. And when money becomes a matter of faith, the question then becomes, okay, do you have more faith in Uncle Sam? More faith in Bitcoin or more faith in the digital yuan or more faith in your Amazon token. So it's going to be a pretty crazy and exciting time because again, there has been a case where America has been bailed out three times. And as Mark Twain said, history doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. So I think that's it for me for the moment. Um, we talked a little bit about this on our Coin Genius Wednesdays with Jeremy Bourne and company and the good folks from Bad Crypto, Joe Com, and even Travis. And every time I say Travis's name, I've got to say Go Chiefs, which is a very sad story, but Go Chiefs. We'll talk about that later. So if you have any questions or comments, Joel is smiling. You can follow me on the LinkedIn at Samson Williams, on the Twitters and the internet at Hustle Fund Baby, and just ask me any question you have, and I'm happy to answer them. My mind is blown. I mean, I had no idea what direction you were going to go with this, but that... <laughs> <laughs> Travis, say something <laughs> so you pop up there. Oh, hello, 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 yeah. How you like that? I, it's, I don't mean to blow your mind, but it, it's within <laughs> the realm of possibilities. And last year, everyone I told this to were like, you're nuts. I'm like, it's happened before. And as the, the circumstances mount up, it's like, yeah, we can see that happening. I will charge you $1 million for Amazon Prime. So does that mean you, uh, what do you see for 2020? Do you see Trump winning the election again or do you see it going to the other side? Um, I don't know. I think we're gonna have a constitutional crisis, honestly. Um, just once upon a time, Joe, I used to be an epidemiologist for the state of Florida. Mm -hmm. I'm old as dirt. And so understanding how uh, the disease is transmitted. Uh, so I wrote an article uh, for my day job called how to stay dry in the rain. And so if you wanna stay dry in the rain, you get an umbrella, you might have boots and a raincoat. So right now that umbrella for COVID-19 is social distancing because COVID-19, it will always be raining COVID-19 until we have a vaccine. So if you wanna stay dry in the COVID-19 rain, you should probably social distance. You might also wanna wear a rain jacket and some boots, which is covering your cough and uh, uh, covering your cough and uh, washing your hands, right? And so it will be interesting as the states go to reopen, give us 21 days to see the curve tick back up on the number of infections, because it's not that everyone's gonna die, it's that everyone is going to overwhelm our hospital systems. And why this is important and how it relates to your question about the election is because older people are more susceptible, 
uh, if you lose enough of them, it just creates a sense of, un of fear, uncertainty, and doubt in the, elector in the electoral body, and then they have to go vote. And this is why in this moment, it might be hazardous to their health to vote, and they might be voting for their lives, in which case, what do they do? Yeah, there's the, yeah, what do they do? Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's one of those things, too. It's like we look at this, and we have countries like Sweden who, who, who didn't lock everything down, and they're building towards herd immunity. Now, I have a very close relative who is a, has a PhD in microbiology and vir virology and said, yeah, this is a, you know, it's a, it's a tough strain that we're dealing with. But, I mean, there's been some cases where America's had 100, 150,000 people die from the flu. Right, right now we're at about 50,000 people dying from this thing and we shut down the economy, treating our constitution as if it was kind of like, you know, privilege, privileges that can be turned on and off. And so I think we are in a constitutional crisis and I think we're not too far away from some serious craziness if some things don't open back up because here we are in summertime and, you know, I know it was like almost 80 degrees where I am today <clears throat> and that temperature alone is going to kill it. So people should probably go outside and not be cooped up in their house all the time. Because when you're cooped up in your house, that increases the odds of you actually getting it because if you're around other people who have it. So I don't know. It's an interesting thing. They said that in, in 1918, when they had the Spanish flu, the best thing for it was to go outside and get lots of fresh air. But here in America now, if you go outside and get in fresh air, you're getting fined a thousand dollars or getting tickets or getting arrested in not Puerto in Rico for going outside. Not in Denver. Yeah. Yeah. Well, some places so going on. What Joel saw on our regular website, we did, we did a hard pivot. I bought a, a mass factory um, because part of it, we bought a mass factory to make uh, facial coverings because people can't afford to pay a thousand dollars. The other, yes, I have, I have, I have my own right here for the 202. That is mine is more fun. Mine's pizza face. <laughs> and so we're, we're, we're going to have a interesting conversation between federalism and state right states rights. And so it's a, a 10th or sorry, 11th amendment conversation. And um, we're going to determine, do we want, what size should our government be when we live in a global community where something on the other side of the world literally impacts us? Uh, I was talking to my buddy, George Pullen, uh, we're writing a book called Blockchain in the Space Economy. Love George. Shout out to Georgie. Right? Shout out to George. Uh, and so in Blockchain in the Space Economy, we're talking about what is the economic, what is currency in space? Because uh, once you get up in the space, it gets a little weird. What has value? And so we're talking about how does quarantine work in space? And you, we decided we would just nuke them. And so it's like, yeah, that's possible where if you know that there's going to be an outbreak of whatever, on some country, because we're aware that the repercussions of letting it go might cost you six to ten trillion dollars. How much does it cost to nuke the place and deal with the fallout later? So, again, we're that's we're crazy, uh, such a crazy theory, and especially that's one of the things is like as I know from my relative who works in the space is yeah they're in there tinkering with shit they shouldn't be tinkering with like oh let's mix this virus over here with this and let's see what it does like ooh and like and if it gets loose then wow look what breaks out it's crazy it's like so. it's like pepsi and mentos man you should not you know it's <laughs> Things do not belong that is God. true that is true so just keep in mind uh if you are in one of those vulnerable populations it will be raining coronavirus until there's a vaccine so Take and then again, the, the vaccine might not even work because the thing mutates so quickly that it's not one vaccine's not going to take care of all of those different strains due to all of those mutations. So Thanks, it's going to make Dr. some Travis. people feel happy. All right, <laughs> Dr. Travis. It's Thank just you. crazy the way things mutate. Our, our resident epidemiologist here, Mr. Travis Wright. Samson Williams, thank oh. you so much for uh, for sharing these crazy predictions we'll we'll definitely revisit in the future and see if they're you know not that. crazy they're gonna come true the only thing i was wrong about was the 49ers winning the super bowl uh, <laughs> that, was it. that was it everything else i'm spot on oh I no wonder. i'm really scared about i'm really scared about this one then this one kind of bothers <laughs> i don't know what we're gonna do about having president president bezos uh, running the federal reserve system or whatever <laughs> I don't know. I wonder if we have that uh, NFT handy that we made. I think I have it right here. So yeah, when we had Samson on the show, he was rooting for the Niners and, and Travis being a, a KC guy, uh, of course, is rooting for the Chiefs. And we released a special non-fungible token 
to listeners of the show and Travis designed it and it looks like this. <laughs> ah, there you go. <laughs> yeah. I, I you actually should be grateful because I had a way dorkier hat on you before because I could, <laughs> it was really hard to, because most of the hats, whenever they sell them, you know, they, they take the little side photo of it. So like none of them fit really on your head to look cool. This uh -huh. had to give you a stocking cap. Oh, thank That's you very cool. much. So I honestly, this year I'm for whatever sports is live so I can go to a game. <laughs> I will root for the Chiefs 110%. Go Little League. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, go Little League. Go Cricket, something. All right, Samson, great to see you. Hope to see you at the Friday night VIP after party, my friend. Likewise, likewise. Stay stay bad, beautiful people. All Appreciate right, you, my care. man. Boy, that is I, mind absolutely blown. I, I just, I, I've never heard that before. That is such an incredible uh, take. So he went well, down some, he went down some interesting rabbit holes to come he, to some of those conclusions. And so he really did. Uh, Travis, I want to give a shout out to one of our sponsors for this uh, conference, Splinter Lens. This is a cool game that I have played myself. It's a next generation trading card game that allows players the core benefits of both physical and digital card games. Mm. Utilizing blockchain technology, gamers can play anytime, trade cards, and earn every time they win players have played over get the 60 million games traded over 1 million dollars worth of cards with each other on the secondary market and they've given out over a hundred thousand dollars to players directly through tournament prizes they're routinely ranked number one on stateofthedaps.com and one of the most successful projects in crypto it is a cool trading card game i've played games like hearthstone before if you're familiar with blizzard and entertainments why play that when you could play this and earn for and actually sell your cards for real world money go to splinterlens.com and check it out today mr travis wright we actually have a we get a, a 10 minute break here for us because we have a special guest host that's going to be interviewing our next guest wait is it the hostess with the mostest it is the hostess with the mostest it's our friend adrian ashley she was recently nominated as the best female influencer in blockchain and named one of the top 45 over 45 but she definitely doesn't look it she's an award-winning tech entrepreneur the founder of stay ventures and she's focusing on teaching family offices and hedge funds the art of blockchain due diligence and that makes her the go-to expert for investors and we're going to welcome her now to virtual blockchain week ms adrian ashley come on down you're the next hostess with the mostest on oh. uh, on the showstest well, hello there. I am very excited to be here. Excellent. I feel, I feel like I need my pretty, pretty background, but it just would not work. You're pretty oh. enough without it. Your hair looks amazing. Thank you. I did it just for you. Very nice. Thank would you, so you much. like to introduce the guest you're going to be interviewing, or would you like me to do it? I would love to do it. Go for it. I am. I am so excited. There is. Uh, there is so much opportunity in blockchain, and this guy, I feel like, has nailed it and figured out the linchpin thing that it's going to take to drive blockchain into the mainstream consumer world. His name is Thomas Carter, and he is the founder of Deal Blocks and Digital Names. And he is going to talk about decentralizing. If you can go, he's going to talk. You got to turn it, turn it, turn it, turn it the other way. <laughs> I'm working on it. It's not flipping around here. There we go. He's going to talk about decentralizing venture capital. And for all of you founders out there, you know how crazy it is trying to get uh, investors to understand the nature of security tokens and what they offer and what benefits they are. So take notes, grab a pen and a piece of paper, because he's going to explain to you a lot of the things that venture capitalists are going to love about this STO market and why he created Deal Blocks. Welcome, Thomas. Hello. Hopefully uh, you can see me okay. I'm having a... Uh... A, a little, little technical difficulty. A little there. challenge here. Yeah. It should be more technical. How's I everybody know. doing? We're all doing phenomenal and super excited. I got a ton of people saying they were excited to hear you. And yeah. they really want to know uh, what it is that this deal blocks thing is. But I actually want to start a little bit back further. One of the reasons that I am so impressed with you is you're not just a money guy. We, we know lots of money guys, but they don't understand yeah. what it means to be an actual founder and invent something and build something and sell something. And you do, going all the way back to your days in Santa Cruz as a surfer who invented the wakeboard. 
Yeah. yeah. That was a that was a fun time. Yeah. So I grew up um, a native Californian and uh, I grew up in S Santa Cruz uh, surfing and skateboarding and um, got an opportunity to eventually uh, get sponsored and, and then uh, become a pro. So that it was funny because I was a pro, but there was no money at the time in action sports, uh, but it was a great experience. And, um, you know, I, uh, I took sort of the action sports industry and um, our, my background in surfing and skateboarding. And when I moved from Santa Cruz, I moved to a place called Clear Lake and there's a lake there. So I, I you know, there was a scurfer, but the, the problem with the product, it, it was uh, like a toy. And so right. we wanted the board to perform because, you know, we're riders and we want to just make the board. So we, we developed some technology that allowed us to make the boards more functional. And that allowed the whole industry to take off. And um, I eventually um, uh, wrote my business plan and uh, raised uh, some money and uh, got acquired and took the company public. So it was a great experience uh, innovating products and uh, learning about capital markets uh, as an entrepreneur in, and taking, you know, ultimately taking the company public. So I, I got a, a crash course in capital markets when I took that company public. And, and going IPO, that is a, an expensive and painful process, which actually leads me to the whole idea of deal blocks. Uh, deal box. There yep. are there are a lot of challenges. I teach hedge funds and family offices how to do mm -hmm. due diligence in crypto. And one of the things that I love about your process is they don't even get on your platform until there's been a really huge amount, six to eight weeks of due diligence performed yeah. on the company to make sure it's actually a real viable company and worthy of being invested in. Yeah. So interesting enough, um, what happened was, is I, uh, I had a software company. I'll just give you a little bit more backstory. So it'll, it'll, uh, yeah, it'll work here. It'll tie in. Yeah. So I, um, I had a software company and we were doing a, um, a pivot in the technology because we had a, all the top professional athletes and we had a high profile athlete that had an issue anyways. So we had to pivot the, the company. We had great technology, great platform. And so I needed to raise money for that pivot. And so um, I focused on putting a comprehensive investment package that would answer all the questions an investor would have. And we wound up getting funded. And then a couple of weeks went by and the funding source that funded us said, hey, we like the way you did your package. You mind doing this for us, right? And so I, I did four deals for them. Yeah. And next thing I know, I'm in the investment uh, packaging uh, capital markets advisory service. And you know, basically what we do is we, we, we take companies through, like you said, an eight to 12 week minimum process um, but I've been fortunate enough to like help over, uh, I think over 400 companies. And as I started to look at different ways to help entrepreneurs, I kept on building technology and automation to try to really create a process, which is deal box, everything you need to do a deal in a box. So yeah. we basically, yeah. So we basically take the entrepreneurs through um, this uh, iterative, iterative process of asking a lot of information, setting up the, the data room, capital markets, uh, uh, capital formation, basically looking at the company where it is today, where they want to exit, then engineer the best capital markets plan, and then provide like an institutional level due diligence data room. So day one, that company could be acquired. I think if you're not- yes, that, was, yes. that was so exciting. You don't understand. I do this. I literally put these things together and put it, and make them investment and Ready. An investable asset, right? Yeah. But the thing, they, it's like, what do you want to do? How do you want to exit? Because that's going to determine how you form and how you put the package together. And when we do mergers and acquisitions, it's always like, oh my God, I have to do this all over again. Well, if we just do it before they get funded the first time, they're instantly acquirable and so much more valuable. It boosts their, their valuation huge. I'm so excited. Yeah, talk? day one. <laughs> I think if you- Day one. If, so entrepreneurs are great at making a product and a service, but they don't make their business a product. If you could productize the asset class, you're going to get wider distribution. So we're really looking to create, um, basically we want to be the button for uh, advisors and funds and, and investors to hit for this asset class. And, and by productizing it, you have all the data sets to go as deep as you want. It's and it just, perfect. It, yeah. And it's then with the blockchain, are you yes. kidding me? So, uh, this was a, uh, we went all in, took a lot of arrows to figure out a lot of stuff out, but uh, really exciting because now what happens is you could program all of this process, a AML, KYC, accreditation verification, uh, cap table. Contract. It's all done. It's all programmed into the, um, into the, uh, into the uh, security token. And right. I hate to use the word token and, you know, it just complicates everything, but it's really a digital issuance. 
We're right. just taking tr traditional capital markets and, and making them frictionless and more compliant, and more accessible through uh, the digitization of the process. And that, that was what's interesting. I've been telling people for years, you know, if we want to drive this into the mainstream thought process, consumers and investors alike, we have to stop using terminology that's blockchain centric, like wallet and token. Yeah. And get those things. Now they do get the security token idea. I was in a room uh, at South by Southwest. I was at a meetup with 30 other major venture capitalists and they were talking about STOs and they were a little trepidatious and they were kind of like, we like it, but we like it, but, but then there's talk yeah. about why STOs are great. Cause I know one of the things that they were really excited about was earlier liquidity. And then also about the, the being able to make sure that they knew who had it and who owned it, the whole KYC AML. And we only have a couple more minutes and I really wanted to dive yeah. into the little names. So I think I have to have you back. So, okay, I'm, I'm gonna go real quick on this. So yeah. um, the benefit of the digital issuance um, is, so what, what do investors want? They wanna get distribution. They wanna get return on investment, right? So and, and one of the things that we're doing is we're um, securitizing the revenue. So if you securitize the revenue, you're gonna get the a distribution as soon as as soon they as the company's it. cash flowing. So you right. get the benefit value of the of the security and the distribution. Yep. And this helps the entrepreneur because he might not have to give up as much equity at this stage. So it helps the investor. It helps the investor with what they want. It helps the issuer with what they want. And I wanted to give you an example about digital names because that's one of our leading uh, companies. And we just completed a two and a half million dollar. Uh, we're... Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Are you there? Sorry yeah. about that. <laughs> quick, quick. Uh, uh, so we, we just completed a two and a half million dollar Series A. We're halfway into the Series A round, but this 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 company I think could be has a lot of potential. It's basically GoDaddy for the blockchain. So instead of the long alphanumeric key, it's just dollar sign your name, and it's 1995, and it works across all the different uh, top cryptocurrencies. So all you need is one name for Bitcoin, one name for Ethereum. Once it's dollar sign your name it works across the top 200 cryptocurrencies. No more 26 hexadecimal keys. And that, is, ladies and gentlemen, is what is going to drive blockchain into the mainstream. That is the solution we've been waiting for. I want to thank you, Mr. Thomas yep. Carter of Dealbox. You are amazing. Your product is awesome. You and I are going to have way more conversations later. Everybody, if you want to find Mr. Thomas Carter, go Google Dealbox blockchain. And yeah, or thomascarter.io. ThomasCarter.io, you can or get him. Or DigitalNames.io. <laughs> DigitalNames.io. And that is all the time that I have for you tonight. Thank you, guys. Thank you really so much. Really appreciate Please. it. Great to Thanks see you, everybody. Thomas. It's been a while. Good to see you guys. Hey, good to see you. Thank you both. Take care. Thank yeah, you, awesome. you. guys. Bye. Good job, guys. Sounds Thanks. Bye-bye. Cool. Wow. That's... Ms. Travis Wright, that's where you're supposed to say interesting. You know what? I got to tell you this. So Chris Pulley, my business partner with CCP Digital, we've known Thomas Carter since, two, we, like, I don't know how long Pulley's known him, but I've known him since 2013. And it's just so wild how he's been in crypto doing all this stuff. And we've yet to have him on the show in any form until right now. That was that was a big faux pas on our on our parts. We, he's a, well, he's we got a great brain. We on unfold that. that paw. There we go. Great there job, go. Chris Pulley, getting him. On the show, smart dude, great resource for folks, dealbox.io. Dealbox, there you go. All right, we've got our next guest ready to come on and share a seriously compelling story. Uh, we had her on Bad Crypto here just a couple months ago, and her name is Sharia May. She's a transformational leader, humanitarian writer, and global speaker, exploring the intersection between advanced technology and humanity. She's an advisor to the World Ethical Data Forum and ambassador to New York Presbyterian Hospital and Columbia University Medical. She attained worldwide attention for making a miraculous recovery from a near-death experience in which doctors could not resuscitate her for over 90 minutes. Yes, you heard me right, an hour and a half of no activity, pretty much dead. But she's back, and we have the proof because she's here with us today. Sharia May, welcome. Hello, how are you, Joel? <laughs> good, good to see you. You too. Where's Travis? Is he around? There he is. <laughs> I'm not around. Hey, I don't Travis. know where he is. He probably... <laughs> slacking off he's sleeping <laughs> yeah, taking a nap i got it. Great to have you. thank you for thank you for agreeing to be part of this uh virtual shindig yeah thanks for having me i'm honored to be alongside so many amazing people on blockchain this has been a fantastic event and kudos to you guys for 
doing this to help raise money for COVID-19. This is absolutely amazing. And you guys put this together so quickly. Um, and it's just, uh, I'm so impressed with the level of detail and professionalism, really. Well, Great thank job. You. We appreciate yeah. that. And uh, we're into shindiggery. That's, you know, that's part of <laughs> that's part of our thing. You know, now we know um, your story because we've gone into it on depth in depth on the show. But why don't you yeah. go ahead and give a quick overview of exactly what you experienced? Yeah. So um, talk, I guess talking about my near death experience or. Yeah. Well, it's so compelling. It's so amazing. <laughs> I mean, this is not the type of story you hear every day. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, this kind of leads up into how I got involved with blockchain. But um, so I was a tech founder um, 10 years ago and everything was going well. I had a lot of clients. I had about 20 people working for me and I ended up flatlining uh, out of the blue one day, cardiac arrest. And oh, no warning signs like it just was like it just came on. It came on pretty much within like three weeks. Mm. So I had trouble breathing for about three weeks, but um, I kind of looked fine and I looked healthy. So um, it, it just went over everyone's head. Like nobody caught that uh, my heart was failing. Mm. So yeah, so it's, um, it's really, um, it, it was a life shattering event. So I, I basically uh, crashed. Thankfully, I was in the emergency room. Doctors were literally unable to resuscitate me for over 90 minutes. Um, they never got my heart to restart. And so um, thankfully, though, by a miracle, I was taken down to New York Presbyterian Hospital in New York City, where um, I underwent uh, several open heart surgeries, life support for about three months, and um, ended up spending five years after that on a bionic heart. And mm. five, five years ago today, I received a heart transplant. So that's the condensed, crazy- Happy anniversary. Yes, thank you. Do you know, I'm, I missed it this year. <laughs> I mean, every year I celebrate and this year is my five year. And- um, or we'll and, celebrate and, with you. Woo. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thousands of people rooting you on right now. <laughs> Woohoo. So here I am. Um, I spent the last five years um, pretty much just rebuilding a life for myself, reinventing myself. And I had lost my tech firm um, just in the whole drama of it all and, um, and spent many years in rehabilitation. And so when I came back, I was still pretty disabled. So I just kind of learned about the latest in, you know, tech apps and all this stuff and created a brand online for myself that um, grew pretty quickly. And I've just since been able to do so many things with my platform, with my voice. And one of the things I've been able to do is just bring value to, um, to blockchain. And to all of you guys and really kind of use my voice more in the, um, you know, I'm not a programmer anymore, but I tend to use my voice now for the storytelling, bringing on more of that um, humanitarian element to it so that more people, more of the masses can actually understand, um, you know, just kind of what's going on because a lot of people see and they hear about blockchain, they hear about cryptocurrency, but it can be very, very overwhelming. <laughs> I mean, especially when you're new to it, it's extremely overwhelming. And it was for me too, even though I'd come from a tech background, like for me, this was completely something new. I was never a day trader. I was never really into stocks or any of that stuff. So I really needed to, to kind of use a different part of my brain to absorb and really be able to visualize um, more of the you know, complex technical elements of it. And that was just done through lots and lots of reading and um, watching events you know, similar to this, although nothing of this you know, caliber. But, but, you know, it really was about staying up late. Sometimes I would watch um, some of these summits that were taking place in 
maybe Taiwan and here I am in the US and I would stay up to like 4 a.m. just listening and taking notes and and learning. And you know, it's funny because after about six months or so of doing that every day, you start to realize, hey, I think I know a little bit more than your average person <laughs> by now. And um, and so that just kind of I think that mix with my brand that had already been building just kind of led me into blockchain. And here I was, I found myself back in the tech world after, you know, this incredible health crisis that I had. And I don't know, it just, it felt so good. You know, I mean, um, I don't know how, how else to explain it other than, you know, when you have like a life altering event like that, you know, such as a pandemic, <laughs> um, but to have, you know, your whole life stripped from you overnight and to lose your business, to lose the career that you had like your whole life, that did something to me, you know? And I think kind of coming back into technology and meeting all the incredible people in blockchain and, and the enthusiasm, right? It describes everyone in blockchain and, and uh, crypto is that we're really passionate about the topic. We're passionate about what the technology can do. Um, and we're passionate about changing the world, right? Mm -hmm. So um, for me, it, it kind of was a nice re-entry back into the tech space, but it took me a while to really figure out where I could best bring value. So for a while there, I was behind the scenes of a blockchain startup for supply chain logistics. And there I learned a lot about supply chains <laughs> and, um, how that all works and the logistics of it, um, some of the issues that they currently have in, you know, tracking and tracing um, goods that are are shipped all over the world from China to the U.S. We're kind of getting a glimpse of that right now with the shortage in um, personal protective equipment, PPE, and the masks, right? So people are starting to understand. Maybe you didn't understand about supply chain before the pandemic, but the pandemic is really shining a light on um, parts of society, our financial sector, technology, um, and supply chain, and where those weaknesses are. And one of the benefits of blockchain that I grew to learn was that blockchain is really, can be a really essential resource and source of um, security, being able to track shipments, being able to, um, you know, hold companies accountable for, you know, either missing, um, missing goods along the way, or even, you know, middlemen that are marking up those, um, those in-between fees <laughs> as you're going from like shipper to shipper or supplier to, to shipper. Um, so there's so many benefits alone in blockchain. And then I started learning about, um, you know, how it's really also allowing more people access to banking, even in developing countries. And so that really, really sparked my attention as well. I, so, I have a question for you, Cherie. What, yeah. um, you know, you talk about the, now it's all about storytelling for yeah. you, right? <laughs> Who is your, you know, ideal avatar? Who are you really looking to speak to, to bring blockchain to the world? Um, I could tell you I've spoken to um, top level uh, uh, CEOs, you know, C-suite, um, uh, definitely executive leadership. So I've spoken all over the world, thankfully. <laughs> um, so I've got that experience, but I also can speak to like your average person that really doesn't know anything about technology and really can't wrap their brain around blockchain. So I think one of the benefits for me, and I've kind of always had that skill set where um, I can, I, I understand technology more than I sound like someone, someone that is like a programmer. And I've always been like that my whole life. It's, you know, same with languages. Like I can pick up a language very quick, but, and I can understand, but I may not be able to like respond, you know, unless I'm really, really studying the exact terminology. And so I think when I was 
you know, kind of younger uh, adulthood building my own tech company and just being a programmer in the field, it, I thought it was like a, a, a fault of mine that I didn't really walk around sounding, you know, very, very technical, yet I was always one of the top programmers on the team and only female. <laughs> um, but I think I, I've grown to realize that that's a skill that I have is that I can listen and learn to really complex ideas in science, medicine, and technology. But then I, once I've learned it, I can disseminate that information out through storytelling, through, you know, facts that people can grasp and not um, lose you in, in the technical lingo. So I'm probably more I, I love being that role, kind of like that in-between role where um, I get to be you know, on media outlets and I get to write articles and really share the, the storytelling and the, hum, the human element behind it all. That's, that's beautiful. And I, I, wanna, I think that's a great segue for, let's talk about the spiritual element, right? Mm -hmm. Because so, so you, you were on the other side for like, what, 90 minutes. You could not be resuscitated. Yeah. So my grandfather, he had passed away and he had a, he had a past life kind of a deal. And then he came back and then he was like, he was adamant about, man, it was completely dark. I didn't see anything. And, I, and, he, and so he was very frightened of death. And I know that whenever we had a conversation and then there's other people that's had different experiences and different sort of perspectives on what that is like. So in that 90 minutes, when you were not physically alive, according to medicine, yeah. what were you experiencing? And did you experience any sort of thing that just made you go, wow, this is a definitive yes, there is this on the other side. Yeah, I mean, I, I clearly had a near-death experience and that's one of the, the aspects that helped me grow my brand is um, I had a very unusual near-death experience. Number one, um, it was due to cardiac arrest. So there were there was medical records indicating, you know, that I was clinically dead, no heartbeat, you know, for many hours. Um, so that's number one. And number two, I had all these signature signs of a near-death experience. So a near-death experience is usually determined by like five main elements. I, I forget, forgive me, I forget all of them, but one of them is like, you know, you saw the light. Um, the next one is like, you had a life review. Um, another one is like, you made a decision whether or not you wanted to come back. So I definitely had all of those but what was most mind blowing about the experience was there were a couple of key things that stand out um, in my journey to the afterlife, <laughs> whatever you wanna call it. Um, and that's that number one, I remember the minute I crossed over. So I literally remember um, uh, almost as if I was just thrown into like another room and I instantly knew I had died and I just remember thinking like the first words in my head were wow that was so easy because my whole life you know and for many people like we're terrified of death we're terrified of the unknown right very similar to the air right now with the pandemic it's like this fear of uncertainty this fear of am I going to die? Right? Like that's such a deep fear for so many people. And what I learned in crossing over was I wasn't alone. I mean, I immediately was greeted by what I call my guides. Um, they had surrounded me. They had protected me from the moment I crossed over. So like now I absolutely know that anybody who crosses over, they are not alone. Like we are not alone. Um, and the other thing is that I consciously remember just feeling like the, the weight of all my burdens just lifted off my shoulders. And so I remember initially wanting to stay there, like not wanting to come back because it, I just, I felt so much love and like connection to all things. And, um, and then I remember I experienced a very, very long lifetime review. So I went through like all these different crazy um, lives, like other lives that I, my soul had lived. It was so wild, but I learned so much through that. 
um, the lessons I walked away with really helped me in number one, making the decision at the end of my life review saying, I choose to come back. I choose to come back here and face my, my, my shadows head on and, and, and like clear them because I knew now like this answers to like how life was connected and why certain people had come into my life and why certain things had happened and why life was playing out the way it was. And it's so fascinating for me because I came back with this brand new, you know, I still had all the trauma to my body, years of rehabilitation, but on the spiritual side, I came back with such a, like almost like a baby with brand new eyes. Everything in the world felt so vibrant, so new, such a blessing, wow. like, like the gratitude was overwhelming. And so I think when, even now, like when I speak and when I talk, even if it's about technology, people always say like, it doesn't matter what you're talking about. We always feel your heart. And I really think that that came from what I just witnessed. Like we were all connected in the afterlife. We were all one, you know, it's kind of like a kind of like an eternal blockchain, right? <laughs> yes, right? A, yes. <laughs> we'll let Cherie, on on that note, yes. um, let's that's a really great high note to uh, to end yeah. our interview. And yeah. thank you for for coming and sharing and inspiring. Oh. Where would you like people to connect with you? Uh, you can definitely visit my website. You can go to sherryame.com. That's C H E R. I E A I M E E dot com. Fantastic. Certainly feel the love. Thank you so much. Well, that was great. Thank you guys. Great and speaking um, with you again. Absolutely. And big shout out to Erin for all her work as well. Yes. <laughs> yes. She's uh she's behind the scenes there. Thanks, Sherry. Yes. Appreciate all right. It. Bye guys. Take care. <laughs> Uh, if for those who don't know, Aaron is our producer and making sure that the show happens and that this event is happening. Um, she's uh, probably a little frenetic because there's just so much activity going on, but we appreciate her and the whole team, really. I mean, Travis and I get to be the monkeys with the microphone, but um, the, the team that helped put this together is super amazing. And so thank you to all of you that are doing that. Travis, would you like to bring in our next guest? I would love to. So I met this guy, I think, what, about three years ago, maybe even a little bit longer than that, I think about three years ago, we were having some conversations around, you know, uh, how great it would be if we could sort of pull interesting points of data all into one place. I said, interesting, you need to drink and uh, pull in all this, have this gap between the legacy data that's out there and, and all this new real world digital asset data sort of become the new Bloomberg terminal, right? So most people who are in the stock market, they know the Bloomberg terminal, they use that on a daily basis, but it doesn't include all this cool digital asset stuff. And so uh, the, the brilliant Jeremy Bourne, he built a team and they created this thing called Coin Genius. And uh, he is with us now. How are you doing, good sir? Good, good. How are you? Doing, doing amazing. Thank you good. so much. You're going to be talking about de uh, uh, democratizing data for a digital economy. Yes, sir. Excited. Thank you, guys. Just want to start off by saying thank you guys for putting this on. This incredible content. Some of the best and most influential people in the space. Um, it's pretty amazing what you guys were able to do and coordinate this and uh, you guys are running the whole thing. So it must be uh, pretty tiring. It, well, you know, during this time, the adrenaline's going, right? Yeah. It's when it's all yeah. over that it's like, okay, <laughs> we're gonna do it again tomorrow. Exactly. Yes, at about 10 30 Eastern time, I'm gonna sit in my chair and I'm just gonna chill and it's gonna be, ah, I, yeah. you know what? I actually slept for 10 hours last night because my brain was so exhausted. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about data. Uh, because okay. what you guys do at Coin Genius is you analyze all the data, and yep. if you're going to be a trader, that's that's important, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, how we look at it is the following, which is you know, blockchain and crypto is still you know, 10, 11 years old, right? So this is still brand new. At the end of the day, you know, this is not capital markets. This is in equities and you know, trading stocks. Um, this is a brand new world, and um, there's not a lot of infrastructure there yet. Um, it's getting there, but overall, um, we still have a long way to go. 
So for the average person that's coming into the space, it's really important that we empower them with the highest quality data possible um, so that um, they can make more educated decisions based on data. And our idea is to hopefully take the emotion out of trading, which you can never do fully. However, um, if we can empower them with good data, then I think they have a standing chance. And that's great because you guys are pulling data from all kinds of sources. And you have this visualizer that we saw when we were in Vegas. You popped yep. up this 3D visualizer that's showing in real time, like here's the buys, here's the sells, here's the big wall. Then all of a sudden you see some whale come in and just, boom, and you see this huge wall coming up and you're like, what? This is, yep. this is amazing. So, and I think the tools like that, the, the visualization of that is something that really can be impactful and help you know, guide maybe some of your trading. And so well, let me ask you this, how, how is Coin Genius, you know, looking to help the industry grow and, and gain adoption? Yeah, sure. So uh, as I said, we're, we're wanting to aggregate the top 10% of all the data in the space, right? Um, and then that coupled with, like you said, strong visualization. So, you know, you need to make an interface that's very easy for anybody to understand. So, you know, any visualization on the site has to tell a story and convey what that image means within three seconds of somebody looking at it, right? To capture their attention. So if I'm a random person coming on, even like going to Coinbase, right? You can see, you know, it's a very easy user experience. You can understand the price of Bitcoin very easily. But outside of that, I, you know, if you're the, an average person has nothing to do with crypto and know nothing about it, do you really know what to do from there or where to navigate or what the coins mean? Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, well, what's Bitcoin Cash? So my whole point is, is we need to democratize the data in such a way to where it's not only a strong visual experience, but also an educational experience that leads people down a specific path so they can learn along the way because not everybody is a crypto expert. Yes, maybe at this conference, most people are, but uh, the average person still is foraying into the space and we need to really help empower them with better experiences. Yeah, so we're going through a really interesting time right now, obviously, and as you're evaluating data related to the COVID-19 shutdown and the economic you know, situation that it is, what do you think that is going to happen on the other side of this after businesses do open up, economically speaking? Yeah, so, um, you know, I always like to uh, position myself as the least intelligent guy in the room at any given time. So I try to surround myself with geniuses. No, that, that's me. I'm sorry. There you, you go. Can't, you can't have that right now. I concur. I was going to say Joel, but I don't want to be. Uh, it's, it's me. Um, so with that said, I, I don't think I'm a you know stupid guy by any stretch of the imagination. So you can imagine some of the folks on my team and you guys know them personally. You know, Samson Williams spoke earlier. Um, which is part of the Genius Network, the extended network of people that we've kind of custom curated and brought into this, uh, you know, genius fold over the last two and a half, three years to find the brightest and most intelligent folks, not only in crypto and blockchain, but in other markets. The uh, conference that we just held had people that were all over the place, you know, uh, regulators, you know, people were doing the uh, regulatory stuff around crypto, people that were fighting on the front lines of COVID-19 that are medical professionals. So just trying to look at it from all angles and collectively what I think the, uh, the team internally, as well as our advisors and the people in the Genius Network collectively are saying is, is that we agree that there is an inherent problem underneath all of this COVID stuff. This is terrible. Yes, people are dying. Um, you know, obviously new studies are coming out in terms of, you know, how significant this virus is and really what the death rate may truly be versus what I think we we all thought it might have been. Um, but at the end of the day, I think there's some economic struggles that we're facing that were exacerbated by the COVID-19 crisis. Um, and that is going to be really hard to rebound from, right? I think we're injecting a tremendous amount of money because there's really no other option, right? You have to inject money. Otherwise, you know, you go through a, a massive cleansing which I think the cleansing is going to happen regardless of how much money we put into the economy. But at the end of the day, the average person is suffering right now, right? And not even just from the virus, but economically they're suffering. I have people that I know firsthand that have gone from having pretty significant jobs, right? Where they're, they're making their, you know, their rent, they're paying bills, they're doing okay in life. And then all of a sudden within two days, they're on food stamps, right? Literally, that is the impact that people are experiencing uh, based on, you know, having to stay at home and not being able to operate a normal business. So I think on the other side of this, obviously, you know, you hear it over and over again, fundamentally, we're going to have to change the way in which we approach business. Um, there's, you know, a tremendous amount of opportunities and CoinGenius sees plenty of those um, to connect people just like you guys are doing right now, connecting people that so desperately have a thirst for connecting with others that otherwise, you know, in the real world and the world we used to live in, we could 
go to a conference. We could say hello, you know, I could shake your hand. That's not the world we live in anymore. You know, I think there's going to be a, a steep learning curve for how to refactor certain businesses that were literally built around in-person and person-to-person interaction. That's just not going to be there. So if you don't change, it's going to be a very Darwinian moment and, you know, the strongest are going to survive. So it's going to be very interesting to see how that plays out. So true. You just said interesting. Now everybody has to drink. Um, so, <laughs> nice. so, so tell us about, tell us about what Coin Genius has coming up and tell us how can folks participate in those Wednesday Coin Genius magical sessions that happen uh, each each week. Yeah, absolutely. So we're working on quite a, a few different things here. Um, our main focus right now is creating a tremendous amount of content. Um, so as I alluded to, we have a tremendous amount of geniuses um, that are very interesting. I had to say that because I want to see if you guys would drink. drink. Um, <laughs> there you go. Um, these people bring a lot to the table. And one of the things that you're talking about is Genius Wednesday. So that's a lot of our content. Um, that was internal only uh, for a while. And now we're opening that up to the public. So you can go to coingenius.ai and find out more about that. Reach out to us. Um, that's going to be opened up to the masses in the, in the next week or so. Um, and I think, aren't you guys, um, you're hosting uh, an after event here. Is it tomorrow night? Um, so we're doing one tonight and one tomorrow night at 7 p.m. So please join us. Uh, it's the uh, networking party after. But yeah, there's a lot of interesting things happening. Um, a lot of really cool analytics that we're about to release. And we also have our own summit, Collective Intelligence. Uh, the second one will be uh, at the end of June. So look out for that as well. But really excited to be here. And thank you guys for the opportunity. Excellent. Thanks, Jeremy. I'm just checking this our agenda to see if we've got link to your uh your event tonight. I don't see it there. So maybe if the team could let us know where we can send people, we'll give a shout out. So if people want to join you later tonight, we'll, uh, we'll do that. So, okay. Absolutely. Thanks man. Appreciate it. Thank you guys. Appreciate it. Have a good one. Thank you, Mr. Bourne. Appreciate you brother. Uh, you take, too. Bye. Take care. All right. Jeremy Bourne. I had to, stuff. I had to turn my standing desk down and now I'm sitting. I am standing. In fact, I'm doing this whole thing standing. I've been on my feet for days. I've not yet sat down. I'm just kind of sitting down me. right now. So no, just so you know, I'm almost, I'm almost stand right here. I feel so very comfortable. Let's uh, let's bring on our next guest and actually uh, a partner for us because she is not only a reporter for coin telegraph, a public speaker, but she is also the host of the crypto chick, our sister podcast at bad crypto. And she's had over 10 years of experience writing about tech covering blockchain and crypto space since 2017. And she's currently writing a book on the enterprise blockchain. Her name is Rachel Wolfson. And we're going to welcome her right now to virtual blockchain week. Hello, Rachel. Hi. Hi, Joel. Say hi to Travis too. It hurts his feelings. Yeah, here's my feeling when I get ignored. <laughs> hi, Travis. How are you guys? <laughs> Excellent. Uh, you, you look lovely as does your background there, like wherever it is you're staying. Very nice. Thank you. Yep. In the Bay Area. Perfect. Somewhere Perfect. in the Bay Area. <laughs> yes. I know you've got um, a short talk you want to provide us with, and I've actually got your, uh, your slides right here, and I will be your slide uh, slave here. So <laughs> you just tell me when to, when to click. And, um, and I will do so. Okay, great. So yeah, I guess um, I'll just start off by giving uh, an introduction about my presentation and about myself. So my presentation is entitled A Journalist's Perspective of the Blockchain Industry. And before I go into the presentation, I'll just, um, for those of you who don't know who I am, I'll, I'll give some background. My name is Rachel Wolfson and I'm a reporter with Cointelegraph. I've been writing about the blockchain and cryptocurrency space for over three years now. Um, since 2017, I've been writing about the space and I've been with various publications. So I started with Huffington Post in 2017. Um, my first article focused on blockchain for supply chain management. And I found it fascinating that this technology powering Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies could also be applied in, you know, the real world. So I think that's really what caught my attention with blockchain was the fact that I, you know, was thought Bitcoin was great and the fact that the technology could be applied elsewhere, which, which I still think is really cool. So 
Um, from Huffington Post, I ended up becoming a staff writer at Bitcoin Magazine in December 2017. I connected with an editor at Bitcoin Magazine when I was at my first Bitcoin conference in Hong Kong, uh, right before Bitcoin hit its all-time high in December 2017. And then around February 2018, I became a contributing writer for Forbes. Um, and I was with Forbes for about two years. Um, March 2018, I also joined the Bad Crypto Podcast as a podcast host for the Crypto Chick Show. So I am a part of the Bad Crypto crew. I'm really proud of that. And I really enjoy doing the podcast. And then in November 2019, I became a reporter with Cointelegraph, where I am currently still writing and loving every minute of that. So that's kind of my journey into the space um, with different publications. <clears throat> and um, yeah, so far, so good. So um, great. So with that in mind, I will just kind of tell you guys a little bit about my experience in the space for the time that I've been in. Um, Joel, if we can go to the, I think it starts with 2017, the slide about the ICO craze, and then it kind of is a timeline. Yeah, great. Thank you. So when I first started reporting about the space, it was 2017, and ICOs were really cool back then. Um, people weren't really interested in the technology as much as they were about, you know, cryptocurrency and this new fundraising method called initial coin offerings. Um, keep in mind, Bitcoin did hit its all time high in December 2017. So when I first entered the space, it was really all about crypto It was all about ICOs and raising money and these cryptocurrency startups, you know, emerging and people fundraising through, you know, Bitcoin and Ethereum and all of that. So it was really starting to gain hype in 2017. Um, interestingly enough, after Bitcoin hit its all-time high in December 2017, it reached almost $20,000 for one Bitcoin. Uh, enterprises started to get interested in the space. At least that's what I think, you know, from my perspective, I started seeing in 2018 the emergence of enterprise blockchain. And I don't know if it was because Bitcoin really hyped up the space and people started realizing, oh, blockchain can be used as, you know, a technology for real world applications. Um, I'm not really sure why 2018, you know, enterprises started getting, getting interested in that, but that's, that's what I saw. So enterprise blockchain emerged in 2018. When I say enterprise blockchain, some of you might be wondering, what does that mean? So let me explain that to you. So enterprise blockchain is basically enterprises leveraging blockchain as a technology for real world applications. So for instance, IBM blockchain, one of my, you know, well, I report on them a lot and I really like the team there. So IBM blockchain is really um, doing a lot in terms of using the technology to power really interesting real world applications. For instance, IBM's food trust network. The Food Trust Network has nothing to do with cryptocurrency whatsoever, but it's completely powered by the IBM blockchain network, which is powered by Hyperledger Fabric, which is a private permission blockchain. And so what that allows people to do, it allows the network participants to track and trace food directly from its source, like the farm, all the way to the retailer and sometimes to the consumer. So the Food Trust Network is super interesting because it's using blockchain to show consumers like myself, like you guys, where your food comes from. And that's all powered by blockchain, powered by Hyperledger Fabric, private permission network, which let me explain this to you guys. It's different than the Bitcoin blockchain. The Bitcoin blockchain is an open public blockchain network. Um, a private permission network, such as Hyperledger Fabric, is it's closed to the network participants. It's still open in some ways, but for the most part, the information remains um, you know, closed. If a network participant wants to see information, that information can usually be requested. Um, although everything is recorded on a transparent network, it's just not as open like the Bitcoin network is. So um, a lot of enterprises choose to use private permission networks because it keeps their information private yet they still have that transparency and information is still recorded on the ledger. So you can see all of those transactions. You can see 
that, you know, an avocado was grown in this farm and then it was sent to, you know, wherever they get sent. And then it was sent to the grocery store and then it was sent or then you bought it and you can actually see sometimes um, that entire transactional chain just because blockchain is powering that. So 2018, Enterprise Blockchain emerged. Super cool. I, I became even more interested in that because, um, you know, for, for me, a consumer, someone who's very conscious about where their food comes from and, and where other things come from, blockchain is um, really all about transparency, immutability and it's not just for the companies leveraging it but it's also for the consumers as well so um, i'm going to get into another really interesting use case about that coming up and that's actually using a public blockchain for enterprise blockchain so i hope you guys are still following me um, i'm just going to jump into 2019 now so in 2019, what I started seeing as a journalist covering the space was the emergence of security tokens and regulations. So I'll start by speaking about regulations. So if you think about the space, 2017, really a lot about ICOs, cryptocurrencies. 2018, the major players like IBM, Oracle, Salesforce, they start leveraging blockchain as a technology. 2019 regulations come into play. Why? Because mainstream adoption is starting to happen. And you know that's just what happens when mainstream adoption occurs. Uh, regulations come into place. So what, what do I mean by regulations? I mean that um, cryptocurrency and taxes start gaining some traction. Now, um, everybody that makes transactions using digital currencies has to uh, report that for their taxes. And we started really seeing that, um, you know, occur in 2019. I think that, you know, laws were being passed saying that, you know, we're going to have to start reporting cryptocurrency transactions on our taxes. Um, another thing that started happening in 2019 was um, something similar to the Bank Secrecy Act which is, and I actually learned about this, I'm looking at some notes here, at a Cypher Trace conference in 2019, the Financial As Action Task Force guidelines came about, which um, explained how digital assets should be regulated. So what that meant, it was known, it's known as the travel rule, and that requires regulators and virtual asset service providers, which are cryptocurrency exchanges, to, um, to collect and share personal data during transactions. Now, this guideline is very similar to the Bank Secrecy Act. And we started seeing that emerge in 2019. So that's another example of a regulation on top of the whole crypto tax thing. Um, also, interestingly enough, and I reported on some stories about this crypto taxes um, when they started gaining traction, which actually they still are right now, but like big firms like Thomson Reuters, um, they're involved with um, some of the crypto tax side of things. So we're seeing a lot of, you know, larger firms also getting into this space in terms of regulations, which, which is pretty interesting. Um, so now I'll chat a little bit about the security side of things. So interestingly enough, I first heard the term STO, which is a security token offering, in the summer of 2018, I was fortunate enough to go to um, a polymath roundtable in Barbados, which was all about STOs. And at that time, I actually still confused STOs with ICOs. And it was really embarrassing because we were all having this roundtable discussion about STOs and I really didn't get it. I was like, STO, ICO, like what's the difference? So um, anyways, that was 2018, super early for STOs. 2019, we're really see well. We we started seeing more STOs emerge. Um, so basically, STOs are when investors receive tokens for funding projects, and those tokens are backed by real world assets like stocks, bonds, or real estate. So rather than ICOs, which are you know backed by tokens like Bitcoin and Ethereum, and there were a lot of scams associated with ICOs. It's really unfortunate. Um, STOs are backed by real world assets. Um, interestingly enough, 
Um, we also have been seeing real estate security tokens gain traction. I was just reading a wonderful Cointelegraph article about this, that real estate security tokens make up 14.5% of total trade in tokenized securities. So pretty interesting. Um, I see a lot of potential for uh, tokenized real estate transactions and all of that. So yeah, 2019 regulations and securities. Finally, 2020 um, happens, the best year ever so far, right? Um, <laughs> anyways, and so in my opinion, in 2020, what we start seeing are the serious players remaining in the space. So a lot of the ICOs that were, you know, scammy, whatever, a lot of those bad actors kind of disappeared. 2020, we still see really great projects and real world innovation happening. IBM blockchain, Oracle, Salesforce, VeChain, um, Real Items Foundation, what they're doing. I mean, just so many more companies that, you know, I don't want to drop so many names, but you guys get the point. These are serious players using blockchain for real world applications to provide transparency, immutability, accountability, everything that a blockchain ledger provides that a, a normal database simply can't. I mean, when it comes to transparency, blockchain is really the way to go which is why supply chain management for blockchain is one of the most interesting use cases. And I write a lot about that. Okay, current state of blockchain. I know I just, I think I have a few minutes left, but I'll just talk about some of the most interesting stories that I've covered lately. So I'm gonna start off by talking about VeChain's public blockchain. VeChain is a public blockchain. It's different than Hyperledger Fabric or you know IBM blockchain, which is powered by Hyperledger Fabric. That's private permission. VeChain is public, it's open, and interestingly enough, it's being leveraged by real items company to trace and ensure that KN95 masks are authentic. Right now, obviously, there's a huge shortage of medical supplies with COVID-19 happening, and v, um, real items company is leveraging VeChain's blockchain to ensure that these products are authentic by having all those transactions with the company that they're working with put on the VeChain ledger to show consumers once they get those masks, they can actually scan a barcode and see, oh, this mask was produced in this factory and it is a legitimate KN95 mask as opposed to the fake ones, which actually there's a lot of fake KN95 masks out there and other products that come from China um, that are fake. So. VeChain's public blockchain is really incredible, especially for this use case, which I'm extremely interested in um, learning more about. Another interesting use of blockchain that we're seeing today um, are voting systems, blockchain-based voting systems. For instance, votes, um, I know that they've been leveraged. I think they were just leveraged in the Utah election, but they've also been used in the West Virginia election. Um, and it's just a blockchain based voting system, meaning that um, you can do this on your mobile phone, you can vote, everything gets recorded to the ledger. I'm not sure which net, which um, if it's their own blockchain or if they're leveraging another network, but everything gets recorded, votes are sent in, you can make sure that your vote actually counts because it's a transparent process. Um, so I think we're going to start seeing blockchain based voting systems emerge, especially this year with COVID-19. Keep in mind, while blockchain based voting systems provide more transparency because it's a blockchain network, they are not more secure than just regular internet based voting systems. Blockchains really in this use case simply provide transparency. So a lot of people think, oh, well, blockchain networks might be more secure. Um, no, that's not the case. At least that's, that's what I've been told. That's what I think. Maybe somebody is going to disagree. Who knows? Um, anyways, another interesting use case of blockchain today, and a lot of this has to do with COVID-19 because that's just kind of the situation we're in, but um, it's being leveraged to provide trusted COVID-19 data. So like um, there's a platform, it's called Mipasa. They're leveraging IBM's blockchain network to provide um, trusted COVID-19 data for health officials. Basically, they've partnered with a bunch of organizations that provide that data, including the World Health Organization, which is pretty unbelievable, 
that data is getting uploaded to IBM's blockchain network. And, you know, just through the transparency and data analytics, it's not just blockchain in this case, data analytics plays a big role. Um, Mipasa's network is ensuring that that data is actually correct, accurate, and that it can be trusted once that data has been confirmed that it is legitimate data, then they send that out to health officials and they can you know, make use of that. But there's a lot of misinformation right now. So in this case, blockchain and data analytics really does help. Um, let's see here. Actually, I don't have this one on my slide, but this is something that I covered, let's see, just a few days ago. Um, IBM's blockchain network, they have, um, it's the Rapid Supplier Connect network. It's built on IBM blockchain. And basically what that's doing is it's leveraging blockchain technology to connect buyers, like non, no, buyers as in hospitals to non-traditional PPE suppliers. So non-traditional PPE suppliers, meaning like a clothing company making um, masks for COVID-19. So a lot of the times these hospitals need to be connected to these new non-traditional suppliers and what the Rapid Supplier um, Connect Network is doing is it's using blockchain to connect hospitals to clothing companies, for example, that are making masks. Um, and all of those transactions, everything is recorded on the blockchain. There's digital identity that's being leveraged. Um, I forget who's, who's um, dealing with that, but digital identity is being leveraged there to ensure that all the players on the network are legitimate, good actors that so in, to ensure that, you know, products aren't fake. Um, so I think that the Rapid Supplier Connect Network is a really good use of blockchain today as well. Um, let's see here. So basically, I mean, overall, I think that blockchain as a technology in the real world really brings transparency, immutability, accountability to networks that or two industries actually that lack that so for instance you know the supply chain is a complicated um, system a lot of those supply chains lack transparency and blockchain can help solve that so in my opinion blockchain for supply chain management is one of the best use cases um, blockchain for voting is another great use case Joel, how are we doing on time? Are we okay? Or am I just blabbering now? <laughs> well, you're not blabbering. It's all good stuff, but we do need to wrap it up because okay. uh, we've got a okay. keynote. Okay, sure. So anyways, I'm sure everybody gets the point. Blockchain has really come a long way since 2017 when it was basically this kind of sketchy space filled with ICOs, cryptocurrency, this and that. And now it's being leveraged by the World Health Organization to track COVID-19 data. I mean, we've come a long way in three years. It's amazing. Um, so I'll just wrap up by saying, you know, a lot of people that have read my articles might be interested in how to pitch a journalist like myself. So I'm going to say something really important. Oops, that's my time. It's time. <laughs> <laughs> that's my Good. timer. But just know what, what the journalist beat are. I'm enterprise blockchain. I love that. I like to write about that. You can reach out to me on Twitter at Rachel Wolf zero zero email LinkedIn um, follow up. If I don't get back to you, I'm very friendly and responsive and that's it. Thanks Joel. I can vouch for that. You are friendly and responsive. <laughs> Thank you. And I hope I wasn't blabbering on and on, but no, not at all. It's all good. You know, you're, you are neck deep in this stuff every day and you get to speak to the movers and shakers who are doing it. So we appreciate your input. Thank you, Joel. And I appreciate you guys. You guys are amazing. You did thank what you. you did and you rocked it. So thank you so much for that. Thanks, Travis. I remember meeting you way back in the day when you were just starting your writing journey. Yeah. How, how you have grown. That's awesome. So great to see you yeah. blossom. Amazing thank work. You. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye, Rachel. Bye. Thank you so much. All right. We're going to get into our closing keynote here in just a moment. First, want to give a quick shout out to one of our sponsors, Moby Pay. They are the universal payment ecosystem that lets consumers make a secure fiat and digital currency payments worldwide from a mobile phone in seconds. I've used it. It's fast. There's an integrated reward and payment token called the Mobi coin that connects fiats and digital currencies directly to a global retail marketplace so that you can get cash back 
on purchases, right? It works with, with dirty fiat. Why can't it work with, with crypto as well? The idea is to get rewarded for the purchases that you make. And if you sign up for their beta now, you get $10 in free MBX tokens. Here's what you do. You go to virtualblockchainweek.com and click the sponsors button. Let me put this little uh, thing up here. Little, little thing right here that uh, shows that right there. You click that sponsors button, that blue button right up there up top. And all of our sponsors are right here and they've all got offers for you. You want to take advantage of this by going to this page and see all the various offers that there are. And of course, you'll find MobiPay right here. And they're doing a million MBX giveaway for virtual blockchain week. So do it and it's a good thing. It's a brave new world. It's a brave new world in more ways than one. So what's great to, about this, like we're ending this thing on, on, on a super high note. We just had Rachel Wolfson on to chat about uh, journalism. And next up, we're going to have the CEO of what? The largest crypto exchange in the world. Is that mm -hmm. correct? Yep. Cheng Peng Zhao is the founder and CEO of Binance. He's a serial entrepreneur with a very successful track record of launching startups. He launched Binance in July 2017, same month that we launched Bad Crypto Podcast. We've got a show to show for it. He's got a multi-billion dollar <laughs> cryptocurrency exchange. Yeah. He's here with us tonight to have a fireside chat to share his thoughts. And you might want to change up the picture there, Travis. Hey, CZ, hey, go ahead, turn, go ahead. turn your camera. Hold on. Yeah, let me try to see. Or All we right, can I'm... do like <laughs> this. <laughs> Good to see you. Good to see you, Joe. It's been a, been, a, been a while. Yeah, I know you're a very busy guy, so we appreciate you making time to come and speak to this global audience tonight. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And it's what a fireside that? chat, so I wanted to add some fire to the thing. Oh, wow, nice. <laughs> <laughs> Let's use all the last features in Zoom. There we go. I've got some fire too. All, all nice. the fire. You know, when you started this thing in 2017, you were looking at the, the market and you're like, oh, I, there's room for another exchange that does some things differently and some things better. Did you ever in your wildest dreams think that, you know, 180 days later, you would have the largest crypto exchange in the world? Yeah, no, um, we honestly did, did not have that. Uh, well, our expectation at the time, our goal was we were set. It was uh, let's try to reach number one in three years. So <laughs> three years was the target. So uh, that's the target we set. Uh, but, you know, sometimes you get lucky. Yeah, how but was that, that ramp up period? Because here you are, you're like, all right, we want to be number one in three years. You're number one in six months. Like, what kind of scaling issues did you have at that time to – because for one, people want to be able to trust it. They want to make sure that it's that it's going well and it's not crashing. And you guys did a great job of scaling this thing up. What were some of those things you had to overcome early on as you were scaling the company? Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, basically, as soon as we started, uh, well, we kind of identified there was a number of key issues in the industry at the time. Uh, customer support was very bad. Uh, matching engines are very slow. And uh, also users' interfaces are very... Um, uh, clunky. You have to like scroll back and you, you get on one single web page. You have to scroll back uh, up and down to trade, and there's no mo there's no mobile apps. Uh, and uh, of the two crypto to crypto exchanges that was big at the time, they were only in English, only on web. So there's like uh, and only basically targeting Western users. So we thought there was definitely room for another exchange. <laughs> so um, uh, uh, the same as uh, 200 other people every day. So I think every day there's about 200 new exchanges coming coming online. Um, then and, and even today. Um, we did uh, customer support was one of the hardest things to scale. So everything else, we can just sort of buy more servers. Uh, it's more of an online platform driven business. And um, especially in those early days where we didn't have a lot of the standard operating procedures, uh, we didn't have all the FAQs, all the training materials. Um, so everything coming in was like relatively new to us. And um, I was doing a little bit of a, I was doing quite a lot of customer support. Um, like there was tricky issues, like how do you deal with law enforcement re requests? Um, how do you deal with uh, like a, a user claiming to be somebody else, et cetera. So uh, there was a lot of tricky stuff that in the early days um, that basically gets escalated to me. 
And uh, so um, I think basically in January 2018, in the last, uh, the, in those few days, we were trading also about 11, tri 11 billion uh, trading volume per 24 hours. We had a lot of customer support issues. Um, and last night, well, uh, this morning, we, we we're back at that volume. So we're now at all, all time high volume now. And we're again actually seeing some customer support queues being formed. So we're trying to go through that. But now this time the team is much larger, much more equipped. So we had a lot of different issues, both on the server and on, but I, if I can recollect, uh, most of the server issues are easier to solve. Um, the harder issues are mostly on the customer support side. Yeah. And, well, you um, just also, said, I, I just saw the story on Cointelegraph from the all time high today. You tweeted out, last time we seen 11 billion was in January, 2018. We've seen all time high in trader numbers for a while, but volume wise today is a new record. 11 billion in trading volume over the past 24 hours. Wow. Yeah, so uh, I was surprised as well, as well. In fact, I actually got woken up like at about 3 a.m. my local time <laughs> because the volume was high and everyone's like, okay, well, let, let, let's wake Sizzy up just to, to just to make sure everything's okay. I thought so maybe you had like an implant that goes off when the volume goes, you know, super high. <laughs> no, it's just a regular cell phone. So <laughs> the technology works. <laughs> that's yeah, but that's uh, great. yeah, go ahead. And so just to add a little bit, um, when, we, when Binance first started, we were processing uh, withdrawals manually because we wasn't trusting the risk engines that much. So that was also a big bottleneck for the first month or so, or for the first month and a half. So this is something that most people didn't know. So you actually can launch an exchange and grow really quickly just using manual processing of withdrawals. Mm -hmm. uh, so now everything is automated, of course, but um, uh, so that, that was something else that we had to deal with back then. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. No, very cool. So I want to see, so for one, thank you so much for setting up this, the Binance charity. And, you know, we've had so many great conversations with Jared Wynn and Helen and the team over there. You guys are doing some amazing things with your COVID for crypto. And, and, and we we're very, you know, blessed to be a partner with you guys and, and, and half of the proceeds of all the VIP tickets for this thing. Uh, we, we have going to your charity. Maybe talk about the genesis behind and the origins of setting up this, the charity aspect and, and making sure that it's so transparent and sort of, it seems like you're kind of rethinking charity and making it so transparent. So from our perspective, we think it's very good. We'd love for you to, to share about this. Sure. So the, the transparent charity idea is not new at all. Uh, in fact, I still have a paper that I written in 2014. Uh, is published on GitHub. It's public for people to view. And on GitHub, you can see the last ed, last updated time frame, timestamp. So blockchain offers this uh, innovative way, uh, this new way of being having transparent accounting, a transparent ledger. So this can easily be applied to uh, charities to make it more transparent to ensure all the funds go to the end beneficiaries. So this idea is like we had I had in 2014, and also a. Uh, a crypto to crypto exchange, uh, everybody had the idea when they joined crypto. Um, I had, we uh, while well, I was talking with other people about the idea in 2013. So a lot of the ideas, but the, crypt, the charity project is only possible now because due to Binance's success. Um, uh, so in 2014, we tried to, I tried to, I wrote a piece of paper, tried to push it, uh, but didn't get it, didn't go anywhere. Um, in 2017, 18-ish, we said, well, uh, we now have the means and resources to, to do this. So let, let's, let's do this again. Um, there's a few reasons to do it. There's a few advantages. Uh, number one, is we solve the problem of uh, transparent charity. Uh, number two, I do believe any organization, well, uh, most profitable organizations today should do social impact projects. Um, it's part of giving back. It's part of doing the right thing. Um, I think in business, we should do the right thing. But also, um, once we are able to, then we should also do charity work. Um, so just helping, uh, finding st st strategic places where we can help people in need. Unfortunately, we can't solve, we can't help everybody who's, uh, who needs more money uh, around the world, but we wanna find places where that's very st strategic. Um, and for crypto, there's actually a lot of benefits. Uh, number one is like increases adoption. Look, if I'm gonna give you some donation in crypto, you are more likely to uh, go and get a wallet or reg register an account on exchange to accept it. Uh, so it increases, and that's, that type of adoption is a positive first contact for, for, for a lot of people. 
So it does, uh, it does increase adoption and uh, it also uh, fixed the sort of uh, negative image that was very often associated with crypto uh, owners thinking everybody who owns BTC is a drug lord. So that solves that, uh, that kind of helps with that kind of narrative as well. Um, we also see that um, it also helps the Binance reputation, of course, as well. And we, we are much more, we are being, we are being much better received in a lot of areas and in a lot of countries uh, due to the uh, uh, charity initiative. So there's some, this, there are some selfishness to it, but there are, there are some core values we're trying to push. Well, you know, speaking of transparency, you recently made an acquisition of the most popular site for, you know, having data related to the crypto space, CoinMarketCap. It's a significant purchase. And actually, we had uh, Mati Greenspan was on last night sharing his thoughts, and, and he wanted to know how you manage the ethical boundaries of owning this accumulator of so much data and using that responsibly as the world's biggest crypto exchange. Sure. Um, so I think number one is a uh, coin market cap. Uh, most of the, I, I believe all of the data they have are actually public data. So uh, exchange trading volumes, um, exchange trading data, order book data, etc. Uh, most of those are data that's streamed publicly to anyone who's visiting those exchanges anyway. So it's more like a, a public data aggregator. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, it is one of the most popular, well, it is the most popular place for people to go find that information. Um, uh, so it's a very useful site. I think there's a couple of different concepts there. Um, there's uh, independence, there's neutrality, and there's uh, value to users. Um, and there's sort of uh, fixing problems the team has. So uh, what well, the product has. So there are a, uh, and uh, the influence it has in, in, on the community. So there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a number of those things. The team is relatively independent, uh, but they are part of the overall larger sort of Binance ecosphere, uh, as we say, um, the acquisition is 100%. So uh, we do own it 100%. So we do have we do have control uh, if we if we if we uh, if we want to interfere. But I do want to for all of even even for all of the Binance teams, uh, each team in the, operates relative very independently. So Binance Futures is an independent team. Binance Spot is an independent team. Um, uh, P2P Trading is an independent team. Cross Wallet is a very independent team. Uh, Weatherrax, the India Exchange, is an independent independent team. So this independence. Um, independence does, uh, but we also have matrices that they need to sort of uh, 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 milestones they need to achieve. So both usually those 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 are user numbers, uh, etc. And to achieve user number of growth, uh, they need to provide a valuable platform. So they need to solve some of the issues that users are complaining about. Uh, right now, users complain about two big issues: um, the trading volume ranking, uh, the fake volumes exchange report, some of the exchange report, and then. Um, uh, some of the scam projects peop uh, that people complain about that's being listed on there. Um, and then there's a neutrality piece of it. So uh, I think that's the part people are most concerned about, which is um, um, crypto, uh, crypto mar uh, coin market cap to do interface with many other exchanges and will their ratings be continue to be neutral? And uh, I think yes. So um, Binance does not get any special favors from that perspective. And also, if Binance wants to buy an ad uh, on crypto market cap, uh, Binance will pay for it. So, but to us, it's more left pocket, right pocket. One team pays the other. Uh, but uh, I think that uh, that econ economics still plays uh, even within the Binance ecosphere. Uh, this way, accounting is a lot easier. Uh, how valuable each platform is a lot easier. The market values uh, is a lot easier to, to determine. So we will we will continue to do that. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, I think basically people are naturally worried that now coin market cap, a data aggregator now, uh, is owned by, um, by an exchange, um, or by, by, by Binance, but I think over time, uh, people are, will, will see how we manage it. Um, we will keep it very neutral and we'll, we'll just see how things go. Yeah. Great stuff. My, my next question is, is around, you got some interesting developments that you popped up here recently. And one is BUSD, and the other one is these big uh, Binance mining pools, and how the mining pools are doing some really interesting things in ways that other cryptos maybe aren't mining. You want to uh, maybe talk about those topics because it seems like you guys are always over there innovating and creating new things, and I think this is some stuff that people need to know about. Sure. Uh yeah, so Binance teams are organizing a very loose structure. So it's very um, 
uh, it's good in the sense that everyone gets a lot of freedom and they get uh, they get to do a lot of things, different things they want to do. And this is why there's so many different projects being worked on, etc. cetera. Uh, my, my, uh, my understanding of the world is when people are working on something they want to work on, they do a much better job than do, working on something that uh, somebody else asked them to work on. So we give a very high degree of freedom. And in, uh, luckily, most of, almost all of the work in Binance is interesting. Just pe different people have different interests. So they work on different, different things. We are loose. To, we are we are, we give a we give freedom to the to the point where it's very chaotic. It's actually um, if you join the Binance team, you actually couldn't. It, it looks it looks completely like chaos. So you can't find any. <laughs> uh, so uh, this we have the reverse side of the problem. But the from an innovation perspective, it does go quite well. Um, and uh, uh, most most of the bigger projects, like a mining pool, um, uh, sometimes the idea comes from the individual. Sometimes it comes from a, a conversation. We'll sit down and we'll 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 we'll, we'll, we'll draft out a, a few targets or a few uh, uh, OKRs or metrics that uh, that like I say initial target, and then they go they go away and they either hire people or uh, attract people from other steal people from other teams and then and, and then go build it. Um, but we care about execution, so everything launches. Um, um, and uh, <clears throat> so on the BUSD side, uh, we launched it about a year or so ago, and now it's slowly getting uh, slowly getting traction. Uh, very recently, BitPay um, uh, integrated integrated that into their payment system. So now you can use BUSD to pay for uh, uh, stuff like uh, they accept people from fifty states uh, from United States and uh, also globally. So that's a really strong development. So um, BUSD is also accepted by um, Bermudian government to pay for taxes. Um, so that's also a very strong endorsement. Uh, BUSD is also regulated and fully audited by, uh, by financial audit firms and fully regulated, fully regulated by NYDFS, which is one of the stricter uh, regulators in the world. So um, there's uh, full transparency that the cash reserves are there, uh, they're fully audited, et cetera. So it's a, very trans it's a fairly transparent and uh, peace of mind uh, stable coin. Um, so that's going quite well. Um, the mining pool is quite interesting as well. It came from a more casual conversation. Um, and the, ca the mining pool, uh, we just said, look, uh, the, um, the, the Bitcoin mining is relatively centralized right now. Among, like, there's a few large mining pools uh, that's, that have a lot of influence. Um, and uh, we want to throw, our, throw our, our name in the hat and just say, look, we want to provide a mining pool as well so that there's a slightly more distribution. Uh, we do have uh, more. Uh, we do have a uh, reputation and also influence on users. So um, on the day of launch, we actually rank 11th in the world of all mining pools. So uh, it's not it's not super big, but it's not it's also not super small. Um, so you guys had actually, to buy a whole lot of equipment and different servers all over, or was this existing equipment that you had? You just consolidated it, or you bought a bunch of equipment to, for this specific purpose? I actually don't know. My understanding is we're running a mining pool, not a mining farm. So we basically, uh, so we run mostly like a bunch of servers that runs a mining pool software uh, with some like uh, configurations and etc. We mm. we talk to other mining farms who have mining equipment uh, to join our mining pool, and um, they basically um, a lot of them are very supportive, and we actually got a pretty decent hash rate right now. Uh, so based on the hash rate we have right now, we we supposed we we should be about one or two blocks a day um, based on the hash rate because we're still quite small. Um, but on the first day of launch, we had, there were uh, they, we were really lucky, so we actually had four blocks. So we have, uh, so that so that was pretty interesting. But um, yeah, I mean it's it's an independent team. Uh, it's led by somebody who uh, who's proven uh, herself and um, she's very strong. So uh, but we thought that having the mining pool actually makes it very easy. For, uh, for miners, there's a minor Bitcoins and then transfer them onto, onto Binance.com, either sell it or, or, or stay there. Um, they can use the mining, uh, people can use the mining power in the future potentially for uh, borrowing uh, to hedge against uh, fluctuation risks, et cetera. So there's a lot of uh, integrations that could, that could happen between the miners and the exchange as well. Uh, we've seen that before, but uh, we've seen that other people from other mining pools are asking us for that, but now we have it already. Um, so um, there's some natural, uh, uh, what do you call it, um, synergies there. So we hope to be able to provide more better, uh, more value services to our users. Yeah. We have the millionth biggest mining pool. So we're just going to try harder. One day we'll, we'll get there. Uh, you are not a guy who minces his words. And there was a, a kerfuffle, as uh, some of us say, a couple months ago. Binance delisted 
Bitcoin SV and you came right out and said that Craig Wright is a fraud, um, you know, for being the biggest exchange and pulling that from, you know, it's, it's still a top, as a top crypto. Um, does, are you also going to pull it off of coin market cap? Uh, not right now. Uh, so the short answer is no, uh, no plans there. Um, uh, coin market cap does list a lot more coins than Binance.com, uh, just because the different nature of the business uh, is just a data aggregator site where just giving data is, uh, uh, has much lower risks um, than uh, enabling trading people's money is in, involved. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, uh, so to be honest, the, the listing of BSV uh, was a tricky decision because BSV is not just Craig Wright. I think Craig Wright is absolutely fraud. Uh, he's, well, he's not Satoshi Nakamoto. Uh, I think anybody has uh, 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 anybody who understands crypto knows that. Uh, <clears throat> hey, don't um, talk about my uncle like that. I'm Travis Wright. It's, we're not related. No, no, don't worry. That's okay. <laughs> That's not yeah. true. So, uh, yeah, so, uh, but BSV does have a following some, somehow. Um, so, uh, especially a lot among Chinese communities or some, uh, so what's interesting is, um, after we delisted it, some of the other exchanges uh, feel that there's no uh, other liquidity and they can, uh, there's probably uh, large traders who think that it's easier to manipulate those, those pri the prices of that coin. So that's probably the easiest uh, coin uh, out of the top 10 to manipulate prices right now. So uh, people do mean, uh, so it does have high fluctuations, which actually draws in a lot more traders. So it, it's, it's one of those tough decisions, but I think, um, uh, Given that Craig Wright is so heavily associated with it, um, it's not worth to uh, list it on Binance.com. But at the same time, um, I don't see the need of uh, removing them from uh, CMC just yet. Um, so we'll, we'll see. Just yet. That's <laughs> you, you've left it wide open yeah. to, to pull Look, that uh, down. Nothing's permanent. Anything could change at any, at, at any minute. So uh, I'll, I never guarantee or promise anything in the future. But right now, there's no plans. Yeah. So I want to ask a question here about, so there's, there's been some stuff going on with uh, a lot of different crypto projects and exchanges and with the SEC, like this one firm, they went and they filed a whole bunch of different lawsuits against everybody like that's, that was doing business for the most part in America. Uh, and it's, it seems to be killing innovation in America because there's so many people out there that are litigious. And it, I think that brings down you know, our, our environment overall, our community, because, you know, we can't be so, we're trying to grow this thing. We're trying to build this, you know, this amazing ecosystem. And then the regulation comes in and over-regulates in some ways and kind of kills that. Is there anything that you can talk about, you know, uh, that stuff that's going on with the SEC? I know that you ended up having to essentially you take Binance.com and out of America and create your own new Binance.us and do business separately in America. Is there, Anything that you can clarify about how doing business in the crypto world in America is and how it's changing? Uh, sure. So I think there's a few different topics you mentioned there. Um, I think re regulatory wise, uh, US uh, right now, to be honest, does not have super clear regulations, but the regulatory agencies do have a lot of power and we don't want to step on the wrong guy's toes. So we uh, worked with uh, BAM Trading Services in the United States, who is our local partner there. And we set up an independent uh, Binance.us exchange uh, that's targeted to service uh, US citizens uh, or US residencies. So, um, so, we want, we, so in, any, in, in, in every country we operate, we want to be fully compliant, uh, working closely with regulators. We don't want to piss off anybody. And so far, I don't think we have. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> we want to be very cautious there. Uh, whether the regulations are too uh, unclear or too tough, too restricted, um, etc. Uh, I do think that is probably a little bit over, overly restrictive in the U.S. To be very honest, uh, it's just a large country, very established, multiple agencies, uh, multiple states. Um, a lot of um, uh, uh, it's a mature traditional financial services market, so you have, it comes with a lot of baggage. So um, I think it would be good if uh, if um, if somebody could actually actively loosen uh, or draft a new set of uh, regulations for. Uh, um, for uh, for cryptocurrencies, I think that will that will that will encourage more innovation, um, and also the some of the uh, crypto specific licenses are very strict uh, in in the states, um, and to the point where I do think it's uh, stifling innovation. Um, so, but um, you know that, that's a personal opinion. Uh, everybody have different opinions, um, and um, I may or may not be right. Um, 
And um, uh, on the other on the other topic of uh, the, the, the I, I guess you were mentioning the class action lawsuits that was filed um, against us plus and plus almost every every other big player in the market. Um, look, it's a we live in, we do live in a free world in that sense. Anybody can sue anybody else. Unfortunately, our society have gone to the point where as soon as somebody sues you, then you um, you you everyone's worried about you, you're guilty, etc. Mm -hmm. um, and people uh, well, luckily. Uh, well, investors would not invest in you, stuff like th there's a bunch of like as long as you have a lawsuit against your head on your head, um, then there's a, there's, there's a bunch of negative effects. Whereas uh, our view, of, uh, my view of the world should be that um, you, should be, you should wait for the ruling before you, like people should be innocent until they're proven guilty. Um, that's the Amen, sort of brother. That's the American yeah. way right there. Yeah. But it should be. It should be so, but we're seeing some uh, conflicting effects uh, where are um, the, I think humans on this book, uh, our fundamental philosophy says we're, we're innocent until proven in, uh, guilty. And then, um, um, but um, the, the way business works right now in a lot of countries, the other people are unwilling to deal with you if you have a lawsuit hanging on your head. But it is a lawsuit. Anybody can sue anybody. Uh, our lawyers are handling it. So mm -hmm. they asked me not to comment on it. So we'll just see how the lawsuit turned out. Um, yeah, so we, we just have to see how that goes. So no comment. Uh, there's a little bit of irony here because while we've been talking, I received this email from Binance.us, earn quarter percent cash back when you buy crypto. I think you you probably told them, make sure Joel gets this email while we're, uh, <laughs> while we're talking. Uh, we appreciate you coming on and, and in closing, if you can give a hint, what is next for Binance? What big uh, you know, efforts are you planning? So to be honest, we, we have a, a lot of a small uh, sort of new projects kind of in the labs, in the experiment stage, but uh, my fundamental focus, like for example, I did not know about that email at all. And I did not know they have a program like that. Um, Binance US is ran by uh, Catherine Cooley and they run a fairly tight ship and an independent team. Um, and uh, so, um, from, from my perspective, I, I, so as I was telling um, one of the other private conf uh, conferences we had very recently, uh, just about a week ago, they were, they were asking like uh, uh, everyone, they were asking everyone the question, what keeps you up at night? Um, so my answer there was like, when crypto price goes up, uh, we just need to make sure the system can handle it. So um, I think yesterday we handled what well, this morning in the last 12 hours or so, we handled it quite beautifully. Um, that's kudos to the team. Um, and uh, so that's what uh, I'm focused on uh, uh, mostly. So just to make sure that the, uh, we provide the right services to our users. It's very basic. I think Coinbase actually went down today with, uh, with for, yeah. yeah, for a period of time. But look, it happens to everybody. Uh, it's not. It's not like we're 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 innocent all the time. So yeah, uh, network glitches happen. It happens to everybody. But um, that's really my main uh, uh, focus right now, which is to make sure that our system can can handle the load. I think uh, very likely Bitcoin will go another 10, 100 X um, sooner or later. Uh, it's just a matter of time. So we just got to get ready. Wow, that's amazing. Now, you, you uh, recently acquired coin market cap. Some people have said the amount is upwards of $400 million. I just want to throw this out there. We have a podcast for sale. <laughs> maybe, a, maybe a blockchain week. I mean, we, we'll take it. <laughs> 100 million, 150, yeah, maybe even 75 million yeah. would be good. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> Hey, right? <laughs> right on. Hey, CZ, thanks again for your time. We know you're a busy guy. I know the world's paying attention. And I, I believe um, Cointelegraph wanted to have a brief interview with you after this, uh, if you're available for them. Yes, yes. Uh, I think that's arranged already. I think that's Very fantastic. Nice. That's 50 to 100 X potential growth on Bitcoin. According to Mr. CZ, that's a, that's a, that's a nice number to hear potentially. Uh, yeah, but my time frame is much longer. So I, I was at decades or, or even longer. So uh, people very often misunderstand the time frame of it. But uh, yeah, uh, I, I, uh, if, if I don't believe that, I wouldn't be here. Right on. Amazing. Yeah. Well, thank you, sir. Right. We appreciate it. Good to see you and best thank of luck. You, thank, thank you, you so having. much. Really an honor to have you here. Cheers. Cheers. Well, there you go. CZ from Binance, the world's biggest crypto exchange. I mean, he's basically building the Amazon of blockchain and cryptocurrency. Mm -hmm. I, I can't wait until it's the Binance Crypto Podcast. It's going to be exciting. <laughs> you're, all, to you're all set on that acquisition. <laughs> Are we going to, do we have to move to China? Well, it can still be BCP, which is, which is good. Oh. So. <laughs>
Bi- Binance Crypto Binance Podcast Crypto is really Binance. good. That's great. Wow. Hey, gang, what a fantastic close for day three, but we're not done yet. We're going to give away one of the Cryptomatic ATMs. And I want to go ahead before we bring our guest in and show you guys this quick video. That's Cryptomatic ATM, our title sponsor for Virtual Blockchain Week. And uh, we're going to get ready here to give away one of these machines tonight from our title sponsor. Uh, With Cryptomatic ATM, you could start your own business, earn passive income with an ATM for buying and selling cryptocurrency. Because as cryptocurrencies become part of our everyday life, today's world demands a simple solution for buying crypto for cash. You can learn more about it at Cryptomatic ATM. And now we want to bring in Mr. Joff Paradise, who is the, uh, the, the chief cook and bottle washer, the CEO at Cryptomatic ATM. And uh, Joff, how you doing, brother? Good to see you again. Hey, you too, guys. Excellent. Would you like to introduce uh, the, the gentleman that we have along with us here? Uh, if you if you don't want to, I can. Well, you know more about him than we do, so go ahead and tell us all about it. All righty. Um, well, Patrick has been with us for quite some time now. Uh, he's an amazing, amazing CEO and director of the company. He orchestrates all the different uh, avenues that has to be done and all the logistics and the sales teams and the manufacturing and all the employees and uh, the man's just a phenomenal and I, I'm, I'm very blessed to have him with us. Uh, of course, I'm a founder and um, one of the uh, shareholders. I'm not the actual owner uh, totally of the company, but Patrick but you do wash the bottles, with, right? I, 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 I try to come in. I try to come in and wash the coffee cups and the bottles every chance I get. Mop the floor. If they let me clean the restroom, I do. You know that. So this is Patrick Dopfner, the CEO at uh, Cryptomatic ATM. Hi, Patrick. Hello. How are you? Excellent. Keep in mind you. that Patrick is located there in Kiev, Ukraine. Uh, he's been, it's 5.05 in the morning. He's been in the office since about midnight, uh, getting, hammering out some things. He said it was peaceful uh, and it was, it was nice, but I bet you I don't catch him there tomorrow night at midnight. <laughs> <laughs> well, are we ready to give away the first of two Cryptomatic ATMs? I think so. If you have the random number generator I, I there. I do. I have it right here. And uh, pull this it up is- on the this is the random number generator right here on Cryptomatic ATM, and I'm do I do I just start it and let it go, or do I have to stop it at some point? Well, what do you think we should do? You you can start it, and then you have to stop it. So we we can talk a couple of seconds. You can count it down. Uh, so it'll it'll have... keep going until I stop it. That is correct. Yes, sir. All right. Let's just get it started then. Let's oh, get it here going. Come the names. Oh, wait till they say um, my name. Wait till they say my name. Is my name not on there? <laughs> Uh, I should have at least five entries in there. Yeah. Joff, why don't you explain um, the delivery of the ATM and go over once more, you know, what that entails so people are clear on it? Perfect. Um, well, first and foremost, we can't logistically pay for shipping for you. We'd love to, but we can't. Um, but there is some logistics that goes on behind the scenes that we will help you do. You'll need a, you know, the shipping company, you'll need a a freight forwarder, you'll need to clear customs and all that paperwork will be done by us. But before all that happens, what we want to do is make sure you have the proper location to locate the ATM. We want to make sure you have all your documentation done properly. We want to make sure that, you know, that you're, you have your account set up and in the exchange that we have, you set up your account, we API it and, and where you have Bitcoin there, you have Ethereum, Litecoin, whatever you, um, whatever coin you, you want to put in there uh, that's on the ATM. Now, the thing I didn't mention is if you have your own crypto and it's actually an open source 
on it and list it on the exchange, we could actually put that on the ATM too. So uh, long story short, we are gonna walk you through step-by-step. Step. There are some software fees, administration fees. Of course, those fees will be, we can work it out. We can work with you on those fees. It's not a big deal. But this is an actual op business opportunity. This machine is a real business. It can be lag bolted down into the ground. So somebody just can't pick it up, take it away. Not that they could, they'd have to be some kind of muscle bound freak, but I mean, they do weigh a little bit like 98, 99 kilos. So that's uh, these machines that we're doing tonight. All right. Well, you know, so I want to be straight up here as I'm watching this go, I'm afraid that the data hasn't loaded properly into it because I'm pretty much seeing a lot of the same names. And I know we have like 3000 people. Yeah, we should have loaded. It might be, we might need to do. Uh, um, I mean, I, I, I just want to be Jesse, clear. Gloria, Bob, Aaron, yeah. something, something doesn't look Jesse. right here. I want to make sure that yeah, it should be going a lot, a lot faster, a lot more names. Let's just, let's do another gender rate, uh, a generator uh tomorrow um if we can let's just do it again tomorrow i, I would i would rather that? do it right yeah me too i i the, the there's definitely something in the background there i need to get with my it team and make okay sure that so that, we're gonna we just gonna, got the list about an hour not even an hour ago no so. no worries like i said you know sometimes technology doesn't do what we mm -hmm. want it to do yeah. it's, it's and we'll give you the list of where it is right now that way okay. they can work on it all day tomorrow so anybody who registers now they're not going to be involved for this one they will be eligible for fridays but not eligible for this one mm -hmm. that way all that data will still be the same no new people will get into this tomorrow we'll just do it tomorrow sounds good okay thank you guys i appreciate the understanding for all of those of uh, for everyone that's on right now that wanted to win, you got to come back tomorrow night to win. Yeah. Okay. Gloria okay. Knight is upset now because her name was. <laughs> <laughs> That's technology. Uh, Joff, Patrick, thanks for coming tonight. We're going to get this working out right and make sure that uh, we, we do this properly. Okay. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you guys. And we, uh, thank you, Joel. And thank you, Travis. We'll see you guys tomorrow night. Right on. We appreciate that. Uh, sorry about the technical glitch there, gang, but we will handle that. And there's going to be a bunch more prizes as well coming from uh from us we've got some wallets that we're going to be putting out uh, we've got some uh bad coin that we're going to give away we've I, there's oh we've got um crypto kaijus from our friend oliver that we're going to be giving away in fact let me go ahead and actually show one of these right now uh, i'm going to turn and while you're off. doing that i want to make sure everyone you can go to virtualblockchainweek.com forward slash agenda and if you click on that agenda or just go to virtualblockchainweek.com click on agenda and scroll down to the end of the day of day three and you will see that coin genius has a networking room available tonight for you folks who want to get in there and and and, and do a little bit of chatting and yeah, so that's going to be available until 11 p.m. Eastern or until they close it. So I don't know. You don't have to you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. Right. This is a, a crypto kaiju, a crypto kitty. It's a it's a really solid. I don't know if it's what they make them of, but they're really nice. And it's got this NFC here at the bottom. And it is um, a physical representation uh, of an NFT. So like the other way around, there's a non-fungible token that supports the validity and the uh, the existence of this. And we're going to be giving away uh, from from Crypto Kaiju. Oh, there's yours. A couple of a couple of these here before the event. Mine's named McCoots McNuggins or something. I don't. Mine know. is uh, McNuggins. <laughs> got some funny name. Hey, I want to do something spontaneous, Mr. Travis, right before we close out, because I see somebody in the waiting room right now, and I don't know if he knows that he's coming on or not, um, but if he does, I'll announce him if he, if he, if he sees, he was just so kind spontaneous. of spontaneous. Yeah. Just being spontaneous. Nick, are you there? Yeah, I'm right here. So uh, turn on your, uh, your camera. I'm because uh, we were going to close out, but we've actually got Nick Spanos here. He's a, a pioneer in the Bitcoin and blockchain tech space, and he founded the Bitcoin Center New York City, which is the world's first ever crypto trading floor in 2013. And you just happened to stumble in here. Like, did you think there was another party going on? Listen, I don't know what the hell's going on. I don't know what time it is. I got to cut my own hair over here. How's it look? <laughs> 
I don't know what the hell is going on around. I don't know what to tell you. I mean, I don't know. I got that sound a like a Joey phone. bag of donuts thing right there. I don't know. I don't know. Party behind I have you, no though. idea what's happening. <laughs> well, as yeah. long as you're here, what in the world is happening? Bitcoin it passed eighty eight hundred. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Holy shit. Hey, and I think Nick has been drinking every time Travis said interesting tonight. I haven't drank in years. Okay. So you're just high on life. Yeah, I don't need that stuff. What's uh what what's happening at the uh the, the Bitcoin NYC center? Yeah, well, uh we got this new space, sort of like uh, three days before they shut down the the city, mm. six thousand square feet. We're trying to well, we, we're not doing anything there yet, you know. Yeah, they're sure. saying you're non essential, Mr. Nick Spanos. 2307 Broadway. Uh, yeah, we're non essential. I don't know. I just, uh, you know, I'm trying to wait it out. I think I'm waited out enough. Yeah, we love this. This is the Easter egg at the end of day three. We didn't even know the Easter egg. Yeah, was we didn't know it was coming. I just saw you there, and and because uh, I think there's other people. The the VIP. How did it go so far? How do you think it went? It's been great. It's been I great. I think we it just... was great. I, every time I went on, there was all these people that meeting each other. How'd you do that with the Zoom? I don't know. Uh, you know, you're magicians, Mister Nick Spanos. Yeah. You can't so, give away so, all the secrets. It's ridiculous. And then they all. Then you had like a speed dating. Had all these different people, incredible people, come yeah. on and uh, talk. And I, I think uh, the future is bright for Bitcoin. I think because we're uh, uh, getting together because of people like you, uh, and maybe me years ago. You know. I mean, I'm trying to get people together again uh, off the street, but right now no one's on the street. So uh, your virtual stuff is incredible. And uh, you guys are creating an inevitable, incredible future for Bitcoin and all of us and decentralization and freedom. And uh, I'm glad only even to be a part of it. Amen, More brother. Part. Well, we're Thank gonna... you for, yeah, for, thanks for all that you've done, man. You've done a lot to really build up, you know, mainstream adoption to the point to where we are today. And so you're one of those, you're one of those OGs who's helped help pave the road for the new G's. Yeah, they paved right on top of me. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Well, we're going to make sure that we get you on Bad Crypto here soon after the dust settles on this. Uh, we'll connect you with Aaron, our producer, and let's do a full-length interview. Excellent, excellent. Sounds great. Thanks, brother. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you, guys. Thank you for all you do. That was Thanks. awesome. All right. Well, yeah. by. That was hilarious. You that never know who's, cool. who's going to pop in randomly thinking there's a party going on. <laughs> Well, there's always a party going on when Mr. Joel Kahn's around. Well, let me until, tell you what. This until he gets is, tired, and then it's not, it's not a party anymore. I'm, I'm tired. It's been a long day, uh, starting with the VIP session, which was amazing. This day one, day two, day three are now officially in the can. And let's take a look at what's coming up tomorrow on day four, Travis. Let me pull up the schedule here. You guys can go look at this yourself on the website at virtualblockchainweek.com. Yeah, uh, starting at 6.30 Eastern time per usual is when Joel and I are going to jump on. And then after that, you, you need to refresh your cash, Mr. Joel Kahn. Okay. Uh, after that, at uh, 6.35, Donnie Dvoren from Brave is going to come on and talk about how, mar how marketers can future-proof their advertising by using the blockchain-based browser. Uh, we're going to have a conversation with uh, Tracy Hudson of Verse, the power of blockchain-based virtual worlds in a pandemic, trading virtual properties, uh, on the blockchain with Upland, Look, looks like there's a misspelling right there, with Dirk of Upland. I mean, we love Upland. Right? Lots of great stuff going on. Charlie Shrem's going to be here. Chris Snook, you guys are not going to want to miss the 740 Eastern uh, tomorrow. Chris Snook, he's going to be doing some really cool stuff with his Zoom slides. You're going to want to check that out. Pump tomorrow? What? Win, win, win. And circumstance. We're going to have both of them. Brandon Bergeson of be Money Pay. Ryan Rodden's going to come and talk about crypto gaming and blockchain. Mm -hmm. We got Jesse Reich of Splinterlands is going to be here. Jen Grayson is going to be talking about teaching blockchain while the pandemic is taking place. Justin Sun of Tron is going to deliver the closing keynote tomorrow night. Really looking forward to it. And there's just so much activity this week. And we hope that you've got to um, just consume all this great content. Of course, if you've missed any of it, you can go to where the streams have been and review. We will be at some point, probably two to three weeks after this is over, having all of the videos edited, broken down and uploaded to our YouTube channel. And of course, if you haven't listened to the Bad Crypto Podcast, we invite you to do so. In fact, I believe Mr. Travis Wright, as we close out, I would like to play 
a video that I can't find at the moment. Same and words. I also want to say thank you to all the folks that are tuning in on this thing. We've had over 3,000 people register for Virtual Blockchain Week. Mm. Some days we've had as many 15, 20,000 different people tuning in at certain times during the day. And uh, wow, it's been, it's been amazing. And I'm doing really good in saying interesting less. I've said it maybe five times today. You become very conscientious of that. I'm going to start saying curious. That's really curious. That's peculiar. Okay, I found it. We're going to play you guys out with this video. We will see you tomorrow for Virtual Blockchain Week, day number four. Stay bad. We love you all. Thank you. Welcome to Bad Crypto, badcryptopodcast.com. We're talking everything blockchain and the shit coins that you own. What news will get you wrecked? What coins are gonna moon? Just sit back and hold on, you'll get that Lambo soon. Bad Crypto, Bad Crypto Podcast. Check us out at badcryptopodcast.com. Cool.